You are live. Awesome. Okay. We're kicking off our chemistry panel with the amazing Dr. Jane Fromer. She earned her PhD in chemistry at Caltech and she's now a science advisor at Calabra. Dr. Jane Fromer is also the 2020 recipient of the Perkins Medal, which is considered the highest honor given in the US chemical industry. And she's authored over a hundred articles and is the co-inventor um, on over 50 issued patents in the fields of electronically conducting polymers and scanning probes based on tunneling and atomic force. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Jane Fromer. Okay, am I on? Yep. You're seeing my, uh, my slides. Yep. Diana, you did a great job of introducing me. Can I just hand my slides over to you and will you give my talk? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Actually, I'm really looking forward to sharing with you today my uh, excitement for what you're doing, uh, particularly in conveying to people who have their whole careers ahead of them, all the opportunities that there are, be it through biological doors, chemistry doors, physics doors, or a combination of those doors. So I hope that by the end of my talk, this slide here no longer confuses you about what are those little triangles doing and those stripes in the background and you'll be perfectly understanding of the fact those triangles are actually DNA origami and they're on a pattern, an electron beam pattern surface. So let's get started in talking about how chemistry provides the underpinnings to so much of our progress in nanotechnology. As was mentioned, um, that's my talk <laughs> and I wanna thank Diane again. Okay, so when you talk about nanotechnology, it really does no good unless you can talk about the nanometer. And if you don't know what a nanometer is, then let's define it. It's one thousandth of a micrometer. That won't do very much good for you if you don't know what a micrometer is, otherwise known as a micron. So let's just do a little bit of background work so that you appreciate the scale that we're working on here. We're gonna define a micron in terms of an ant. Now, how is that gonna happen? Well, an ant has a compound eye and it's made up of many segments. And in between those segments, there are these little sensors. And those sensors are about one micron across. So when you hear the word micron in the future, just think of your buddy, the ant, and think of his eyes and think of those sensors and you'll get a sense for how small things are that we're now operating on. But still a nanometer is one one thousandth of that. And so we're gonna go down yet another three orders of magnitude. Let's do that in terms of relating it to objects that you do know. A uh, human hair is about a hundred microns across and a blood cell is about a 10th of that around eight microns across. We're still 8,000 times bigger than a nanometer. So what is on the nanometer scale? In fact, molecules are. And what's pictured here is an anthracene molecule, and that's about a nanometer across. So when we talk about nanotechnology, we're talking about a ruler that uses the length scale of molecules like this to measure distances. So that's where the nano part of nanotechnology comes from. The fact that we're building things now on the nanometer scale, a nanometer being one thousandth of a micron, and a nanometer being the ruler that we use to measure molecular dimensions. Sometimes you hear the word angstrom, that's one tenth of a nanometer. Okay, if we're gonna make things very small, how do we know we made them? How do we know we made what we drew in our designs in PowerPoints and on the back of envelopes and on whiteboards? we have to somehow be able to prove that we actually made what we thought we made. And to that end, there's been a line of instrumentation developing in the last 20, 30 years since the eighties that have greatly enabled our being able to see what we make, not only see what we make, but actually use these analytical instrumentations to make things themselves. That family of instruments is called scanning probes and it takes on a multiplicity of names. Sometimes it's called atomic force microscope, scanning tunneling microscopes, magnetic force microscopes, et cetera. People sometimes name them after themselves because people like to do stuff like that. But nonetheless, what they all are not is microscopes, which is to say you think of looking through something with your eye or with light when it comes to microscopes. And these in fact do not use an eyepiece or light. 
the term just ca carried over from scoping out on the micro scale. So a lot of my talk today is going to be data which was obtained with scanning probe microscopes because that's what enables us to see what we've done with molecules to make nanostructures. First, let's take a look at some of these microscopes just so you get a sense of what we're talking about. This is, um, this is there are two atomic force microscopes in this picture being run by one person, very talented people do that. Electrical measurements are being made with this particular configuration of a kind of an electrical force microscope. I'm not able to forward here. Oh, there we go. Um, here's another microscope with Bob sitting in front of it. He is measuring nanoparticles with his microscope. You can see behind Harine, there's this tall stack. That's also an atomic force microscope. She's making biological measurements under fluid and she's watching individual either bacteria or actually smaller bacteria than uh, items such as that. She's looking at components, biological components, DNA strands in particular. And finally, here's Gabriella sitting in front of yet another atomic force microscope. The take home lesson to this slide is that we're not talking about huge ultra high vacuum chambers. We're talking about instruments that you can operate out in the atmosphere, out in a room. And you can operate them actually with fluids. You can operate them under gas, under air, in electric fields and magnetic fields. They really take on a lot of different environments to give you a lot of different properties, information. Okay, back to chemistry. This is typically how molecules are represented. We have shorthands, we have space filling molecules, that little Lego toy in the upper left. Sometimes in that design you see on the right, we don't even draw all the atoms in, those zigzags are, chain, are chains of carbon. But nonetheless, this is how we chemists envisions atoms bonded to each other, be they carbons bonded to each other, or carbons bonded to nitrogens, oxygens, chlorines, or, as are shown here. These are all representations of molecules. What do they really look like? Well, let's use, in fact, a scanning tunneling microscope to see what a molecule looks like. And so this will be data that we obtain real time of real molecules, and we're going to show you these with the class of molecules called liquid crystals. First of all, how does the instrument work? You, have, you put your sample on a surface or the, the surface is your sample and you run a very sharp needle over it. That's conducting and your sample is conducting as well or sitting on a conducting surface. And what you're monitoring is the current between that tip and that sample as you raster it across your sample. Let's put some liquid crystals on that surface and repeat this scanning motion. And as we scan over, we're measuring current. And that current is translated into height. And through some clever graphics, we print out what you see here on the right, which are the actual pictures of the molecules. Can you see my, my, um, sen my, <laughs> my sensor here? We have in the picture four or five molecules and bundles before dislocation. In the actual scanning tunneling microscope image, you can see the, the molecules indeed bundled together as four. Four more molecules, four more molecules. What are we looking at in these clouds? Well, what we're seeing is a biphenyl group in this brighter blob here, and we're seeing alkyl chain tails coming off of the molecules here. So in fact, we can see carbon by carbon by carbon in the chain individual atoms that make up the molecules. But even more remarkable, what we're seeing for the first time with this tunneling microscope is the form, the format that these molecules take on interacting with each other as they sit on a surface. That's something that's very difficult to see because normally when you look at materials, you're looking at an assembly or an averaging of them. Here we're looking at the very last layer of molecules as they sit on a surface. Uh, little factoid, liquid crystals, how do they work? They align themselves, as you can see, and that alignment changes as a function of applying a bias, an electrical field to them. And it changes their alignment and allows different amounts of light through. Okay, so that was scanning tunneling microscopes, which rely on a tunneling current between two conductors, a conducting tip and a conducting sample or a sample on a conducting surface. Most materials that we looked at are not conducting. 
So the instruments got diversified in order to look at all sorts of other kinds of molecules. And the materials we're going to look at today are called organic thin films, and they're made by a technique called langmuir blodgett technique, and they stand up on a sample on a substrate. Now, in this particular organic thin film, we've mixed together some fluorocarbons and some hydrocarbons and asked the question, when you put two materials together in solution, how intimately do they mix? Molecule by molecule, group by group, thousands of molecules by thousands of molecules? Well, and how do we know? How do we figure that out? We're going to use this particular atomic force microscope to figure that out. And here's the tip of an atomic force microscope. Unlike the scanning tunneling microscope, it doesn't have to be conductive. So how do we measure its interactions with the surface, those interactions being repulsive and attractive interactions. In fact, we attach that tip to a beam. We call this beam a cantilever. So every time you have an attractive force interaction, this beam tips down and subsequently a beam of light on the back of it deflects onto a photo detector and shows us that there's been an interaction here through a deflection there. Likewise, if there's a repulsive interaction that the beam moves back and there's a deflection on the cantilever in the opposite direction. Now this cartoon here doesn't do justice to just how sharp that tip is. Here it is in real life. It's made out of silicon using semiconductor techniques to create these tips that typically terminate at about 10 nanometers in cross section. 10 nanometers is bigger than a molecule. You might recall that. Uh, a molecule is one nanometer or less, at least small molecules are. So instead of looking at single molecules, typically with atomic force microscopy, we're going to look at a molecular community. In other words, how groups of molecules behave on the nanoscale. Here's that scanning motion going over the molecules, line by line. And what results from it is how those molecules separated on the surface. Okay, do we put smiley faces down in, on the surface? No, of course we don't. I hope you got a bit of a smile from that yourself. What's the scale here? So this image here is about five microns across. What we see are dark islands in a light sea. Those dark islands are the hydrocarbons because they're taller, we can measure the height, than the surrounding sea, which is the fluorocarbon. So now we know that the way that these two molecules separate when you make a mixture of them and then put them down on a surface, and that's very important because the surface sometimes does control how they blend, is as circular islands of hydrocarbons in a continuous sea of fluorocarbons. Okay, that wasn't obvious from other techniques. The reason I chose this picture, this example with the smiley faces is indeed, these did not spontaneously smile at you. Instead, what we did is we went back in and used the stylus of the atomic force micro microscope, not only as a recorder of information, but also as a manipulator of the surface. So in other words, we went in and we gouged out, ooh, that doesn't sound good. We created these features by increasing the force to remove molecules in these places here. So these instruments can both be recording devices and they can be manipulating devices. That's, you'll see a lot more examples of that. Okay, so this kind of news, we can now see single molecules on a surface. How does the rest of the scientific community take news like that? Here's an example from Nature. The date here is rather small. It's 1988 when we first announced that you could see organic molecules one by one on a surface. Now, this was our idea of an organic molecule, dioctyl phthalate, in fact, that we put on graphite. And we not only could see that we had a feature on the surface that roughly corresponded to a molecule, but we also knew that by changing the bias, the voltage between the tip and the sample, we could change this. It looked like we were cleaving off parts of it. We might have been cleaving a single molecule. We might have also been changing the interactions between the molecule and the surface. But nonetheless, we could see this feature respond to the presence of the tip and the bias we were applying. Did I convince you this was a molecule? Well, frankly, we weren't totally convinced either, but to get to that point, we came to this image you see right here a year later. We really needed to put down unambiguous molecules on the surface. So there was no doubt about our just having a blob on a surface. And here you see that liquid crystal picture you saw before. You see how the molecules align. You see how the hydrocarbon tail differentiates from the 
biphenyl head group. And so there's really no ambiguity in this image anymore. We can say with great confidence now that indeed we are directly imaging organic molecules using scanning tunneling microscopy. A little bit perplexing because usually organics are insulating. So it wasn't totally clear why we were getting imaging images, such clear images from molecules that were insulating, but that's the subject of another talk. Finally, a few years later, we then started to use that atomic force microscope that I mentioned before. This is that similar image that you saw before, but it's rendered in 3D. The point here is to say that we're, again, not just imaging or gouging as we did before, but because we're now using a modulated lever to collect these images, we can measure the mechanical properties of the surfaces. So I can measure the elasticity of this hydrocarbon island as being quite different from the elasticity of the surrounding fluorocarbon floor, or the, the friction of this surface being very different from the friction of this background or adhesion. There's many different properties you can measure with a, a mechanical device like that. And it's particularly powerful when you can now do it on the nanometer scale. By the way, any of you who might know that a Teflon pan is coated with fluorocarbon would probably say your friction measurements show this fluorocarbon in the surroundings here to be of lower friction than the hydrocarbon. Nope, that's not what we observe. We observe the opposite. And that's the wonder of working on the nanoscale with nanoscale techniques. And again, that's the subject of a, another lecture or else send me an email. Okay, uh, Professor Colvin will be talking in a couple sessions after mine and she might be bringing up some of her magnetic material. So I'm gonna just briefly introduce one other embodiment of these uh, scanning probe instruments that can measure different properties besides elasticity, adhesion, or placement of molecules, and that is magnetic properties. So magnetic recording disk, which we don't have too many of in your laptops anymore, but or in your telephones using solid state now. But in the day, we did have magnetic recording disks, which had on top of their magnetic layer, a carbon overcoat to protect it so you wouldn't lose data. And the recording head would write bits to that magnetic layer as ones and zeros. A magnetic force microscope was developed. Here it's just being used in topography mode. So this is a view of that carbon overcoat on the magnetic recording disk. It's 10 micron by 10 micron, micron view. It's pretty amorphous, nothing really to write home about. But if you coat that tip with a magnet, and that's what that red tip shows, and you polarize that magnet, then what you're now imaging is no longer that surface topography, but you're imaging the ones and zeros the bits of the disk that lie underneath that carbon coating. In other words, you have customized this instrument, this exquisite measurement device to measure the magnetic poles of features. Where that has particular utility these days is in uh, magnetic nanoparticles used in therapies, also possibly used in memory devices or storage devices. In other words, can we store information in each of these nanoparticles as a one and a zero, as opposed to relying on a magnetic hit head writing bits? Another lecture. <laughs> Let's go back to that opening slide and go a little bit into its background. It, this is being used as an example of how we use chemical forces both to create nano objects and to put them where we want them to be. This is the result of a collaboration between Caltech and IBM Research. Paul Rothman, a colleague at Caltech, created a field, or actually he contributed to a field that was also created at NYU called DNA origami. And DNA origami is taking a single strand, in this case of viral DNA, and folding it up in a manner of your design. And these are some of the designs that Paul created. And the way that he keeps this design intact, holds it together, is what, with what he calls staples. There's red and green and blue and yellow staple. Those are artificial constructs that he programs such that it binds with the sequences of the two domains that you want to hook together. Read this article here if you want to read more about this stunning work. It's really beautiful work. Paul, great job. You created all these items that are about 100 nanometers across. But A, how do you know you created them? And B, how do you find them? And what do you do with them? And to that end, there's a lot of lithography work being done in the semiconductor industry, which 
pattern surfaces. It creates patterns and surfaces, usually with light, but also with a electron beam. And here's a surface that was created on a silicon wafer that had carbon put on top of it. It's a five micron surface. And it was e-beamed with little triangle docking sites across it. A solution of those DNA origami triangles were exposed to it under the right conditions. And almost each docking site was then filled with a DNA triangle. So this answers the question of how do we work with these? How do, we can't reach into this flask here and pull out one of these triangles with a tweezer. So instead we have to customize this surface on the right length scale of these objects and capture them in that manner in the places we want them to be. Well, in fact, if we blow this up, you'll see there's been more of a capture going on. There's actually a directionality to the capture. This row of DNA triangles are all pointing down and this row of DNA triangles are all pointing up. So we have now been able to both capture and orient the DNA. And by the way, you're probably thinking of, well, these holes, I could have rolled marbles across this surface and it would have stuck in the holes. Well, in fact, these holes aren't very deep. What they are is of different chemical composition. This dark bottom of the hole is a different chemical species than this top carbon one, and it's much stickier to the DNA. So what you're really seeing here isn't so much a marble falling into a hole as it is chemi chemistry specific adhesion of the DNA to that darker bottom surface. Okay, these little triangles. So again, this question of great job, Paul, with DNA origami, but why would you want to do that? What, what are you going to do with these? Well, the fundamental philosophy behind it is to show that we can do it, to show that we can controllably manipulate materials on this side, size. But to go ahead, you can think in terms of these DNA origami in and of themselves acting as a chip for other chemistry, for other interactions between molecules. So take one of these 100 nanometer by 100 nanometer DNA origami where we know exactly the sequence of the DNA because that's what Paul programmed. So we know what chemical functionalities are hanging off of this. And let's go ahead and further functionalize the DNA and each of the vertices of this triangle with what we call a sulfhydryl or a mercaptan group. And we just put three into these three sites. And sulfur has a great affinity for gold. And so in fact, when we now expose these DNA triangles that have the sulfur on each corner to gold nanoparticles, we very specifically attach gold particles to each of the three corners. So you can say that what we have created here is a little nano object, an item that has three gold, atoms are actually clusters at spaced 100 nanometers apart at each of the vertices. If we can do this with gold nanoparticles, you can imagine My that- apologies. I couldn't hear what you said. Sorry, that was my Google watch talking to me. <laughs> I should put her to bed. That's, that's nanotechnology too, that I can wear a computer on my, uh, my sleeve, huh? Okay, so back to our DNA triangle. Our, you can see that we have now devised a manner in which we can place small gold cluster, clusters equidistant from each other. Moving along to other materials that have been very popular in creating nanostructures are polymers. Polymers are long chains. You can think of them as a chain. You can think of them as a string of beads made up of links. And each link is typically the same as the one beside it, unless you do a little bit more creative work. In this case, it's a chain of, I'll call them red monomers. And this is a chain of blue monomers. Uh, here we have a red, a, a section with red, section blue, section red. These are actually called block copolymers. Now block copolymers are fascinating in that if I attach this molecule to this one in a way that it can't come apart, it's covalent, then which of these two dominates in the behavior of this assembly here? What's shown here is which of the two dominates in terms of when you crystallize it or take it into the solid state, does it form spheres? Does it form cylinders? Does it form lamellae? And if one of the materials forms that, what does the other material do? Does it go along for the ride or does it assert itself? And that's really a function of how you build these segments in the first place, how long you make these, 
relative to the other, what kind of solvent you use and what kind of temperature you use. A fascinating area of block copolymers. We don't have time to go into it now, but I am gonna show you how this has been so instrumental in forming nano objects. Here we see a block copolymer, let's call this the B phase, which has formed cylindrical domain and the A phase has just filled in between it. We're gonna treat it with a form of energy, either a radiation or heat, which dissolves away that continuous phase. And what does it leave behind? It leaves behind just the, the, the spherical phase. It leaves behind nanoparticles, in fact. And are these of an arbitrary size? No, they aren't. They're all of the same size. And where does that track back to? That tracks back to the block pole polymer that this was originally formed from. And this size here, we have exquisite control of because of the talent of polymer chemists. Likewise, we can dissolve away the continuous phase. Oops, excuse me. We can dissolve away the nanospheres and leave the continuous phase. And what do we have here? We have nano holes. We have nanopores. You can think of it as a membrane or as a filter. And we did that again by selectively reacting the, pore, the, the spheres away from the continuous phase. Are these arbitrary size pores here? No, not at all. Again, they were very intentionally designed by the molecular weight of this red component. Oh, um, Dr. Fromer, I'm so sorry, I don't want to interrupt you, but you asked us for a five minute um, reminder. And I have five minutes left, huh? Okay. Yeah, because we started five minutes late. So I have 10 minutes late left. No, uh, no you have, yeah, five. Okay. I'm going to zip along. Sorry, I, sorry I didn't want to interrupt. But yeah. <laughs> I asked you to, Diana. Thank you. Yeah. I just wanted you to see what those instruments I showed you earlier, how they render this PowerPoint chemistry. We often do PowerPoint chemistry and things look idealized. But in this case, in fact, the atomic force images do mirror quite closely what it is the PowerPoint chemistry conveyed. These AFM, this is an AFM lever with a tip. It's had a bore driven through it so that it can now be used as a liquid delivery system. And I'm gonna move quickly. And in this way, you can see that the AFM probe can now be used to deliver fluids. And it can be used to create patterns that are unusual, that are not regular patterns. Why would you wanna draw grids like this? For example, the reason that we did this, and this is a pro, this was a, a program we had with UC Davis supported by the Gordon Moore Foundation. We did this at a scale that we could trap cells and by virtue of the entrapment, we could change their behavior. That same probe was used to deliver a precursor to copper. It was a copper sulfate solution. And by applying a bias to that tip, as we deposited into that copper sulfate solution, we also reduced and formed copper wire. This is copper wire that's 800 nanometers to five microns across. You can use this tip in a heated mode. And in this case, we're using the tip of an AFM as a volatilizer. This polymer here tends to unzip. And so we're using this heated tip to selectively take material out of this thin film. If that's called a subtractive process as opposed to an additive process. And where's the molecular control here? We've intentionally chosen a polymer that we know responds to heat by vaporizing, vaporizing cleanly. And here we're gonna use that tip in a similar material called a molecular glass to remove in 120 levels and create the Matterhorn. This was done by colleagues in Switzerland, no surprise. And here they've extended it to include the whole world. Fascinating article, you can find this in science. Finally, nanoscale manipulations, nanoscale, nanotechnology. What good is it? The goodness of it is the badness of it. The goodness of it is that it operates on the nanometer scale, but the badness of it, the detraction is that it's so localized that will it ever become commercially feasible? Well, one of the ways to make this still exquisitely well resolved feature by feature, but have it operate over larger scales is to make vast arrays of these tips. And that's what you see here in a cartoon. It was made by IBM Zurich Research Labs. Each of these AFM tips is heated and it is creating features on a surface. They're all connected though, and they're being moved. But what is a, just as much a challenge as doing this nanotechnology under each tip is being able to connect to each of these tips 
with the electronics and to operate them independently. So it's a field not only for chemists in controlling the materials, but it's also a field for the electrical engineers and the physicists and the mechanical engineers to all work together to come up with this chip, these kinds of devices. This one was made in order to be a storage device where each hole that was punched was a zero and each lack of hole was a one, a one zero storage device. Okay, my penultimate slide right before my thanks. This might be somewhat self-serving. This is a profile of me that was created on silicon. Once again, the makers of this picture, this profile, congratulatory profile, which is about one micron across. They're from Asylum Research in Santa Barbara. They created this in silicon oxide that they grew off of a silicon wafer. In other words, by oxidizing a silicon wafer in air where it could grab oxygen from both the water and the air, they created this portrait of me as a thanks for an award that I won. So chemistry in action here. <laughs> Finally, I would like to thank Diana in particular. You, uh, you're a miracle miracle person in pulling this off. I'd like to thank my colleagues at the IBM Research Labs, both in Almaden and Zurich, of whose studies I showed many results today. Also the University of Basel, they're the ones with the happy face. And indeed they made me very happy for the years I was on the faculty with them. Uh, UC Davis, they were the molecular ink deliverers. Caltech, that was the DNA origami. And as you'll hear a lot of today, we couldn't do it. We scientists couldn't do it with our, without our families, our friends. And as I'm learning now, without my students and mentees who are giving back to me by teaching me these days, as I hope you all will. Thank you for your attentions. Thank you so much, Dr. Fromer. That was an amazing talk. And, you know, I, Dr. Fromer thanked me. So I just want to, you know, take the time and thank everyone who helped them as well, you know, with team, uh, team collaboration. Um, so maybe we can take like two questions and then um, we'll get started with the next speaker, Dr. Terry Odom. Any questions? If you have any, don't hold back because we want to get started. So. Okay, I'll save my questions for... Oh. Uh, Dr. Fromer, if, if you saw it, Mark asked how long it took for the picture of you to be made. Um, not very long. These, in, you know, I, and I'm, I'm hedging here because I don't know the exact answer, but these instruments work at a scan rate of over a hertz, for example, and that was probably 256 by 256. So maybe a little bit slower in order for the oxidation process to take place, but it probably didn't take much more than a few minutes. Oh, wow. Things okay. happen fast on the nanometer scale. You don't have that many items to oxidize. <laughs> For sure. All right, if that's all of your, the audience questions, I'll hand it over to Sophie and we can get started with Dr. Terry Odom. Up next, we have Dr. Terry Odom, a Northwestern material chemical professor. Today, she will be discussing her work on the creation of nanoscale materials that not only amaze in their minuscule size, but their optical properties and biological nanostructs. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Terry Odom. Great, thank you. Um, I think I need to share my screen. If I share mine, does that take over from Jane? Let's try it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, awesome. Okay, so thanks everyone for joining us uh, today. I'm always amazed at these, um, how dedicated you students are to having um, learning experiences over the weekend. I think the last time that I, I participated in this uh, amazing discussion, it was on a Sunday right before Memorial Day. And then the students were actually just a tiny bit embarrassed that they were hosting all of these uh, discussions with, uh, with scientists. But um, I'm just amazed that you can do that and you're so far ahead in, uh, in your uh, thinking about science than I ever was as will become crystal clear. <laughs> Okay, so let me get started. Um, let me actually put my own timer so that I can, I would like to have enough time for discussion. 
So uh, I, I talked to Diana about what maybe I could emphasize, and I thought I could highlight some of the science that we've been involved in, but also the journey. I feel like some of the journey is almost as equally important as the scientific contributions. You've heard a little bit of this from, uh, from Jane earlier. So I titled it, uh, Follow the Nano Brick Road. Hopefully that rings some bells on um, old favorites. Um, but really it's, um, I consider my journey about the story of us, meaning there are a lot of people that are involved in either making you as a person or in contributing to a discovery. And I just wanted to share a little bit about those people with you. Um, first, on um, their training of me as a scientist. And then second, their training uh, and mentoring of me as a professor, because these are two totally different things. Okay, so there's, um, there's a visionary that invited us to think about nanoscience, um, Richard Feynman. And he gave this famous speech, there's plenty of room at the bottom. And he says, people tell me about miniaturization and how far it has progressed today. They tell me about electric motors that are the size of the nail on your small finger. And there's a device on the market, they tell me, by which you can write the Lord's Prayer on the head of a pen. But that's nothing. That's the most primitive halting step in the direction I intend to discuss. It is a staggeringly small world that is below. And in the year 2000, when they look back at this age, they will wonder why it was not until the year 1960 that anybody begins seriously to move in this direction. Why cannot we write the entire 24 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica on the head of a pen? And part of the answer to that, of course, is what uh, the previous speaker already introduced to us. We needed to be able to manipulate atoms and molecules one by one at the nanometer scale. But also what was interesting about 1960, and I'll talk about this uh, towards the end of the talk, is that this is when the, the laser was invented. And so the laser um, is, is an amazing uh, uh, light amplified stimulated emission of radiation, but nobody knew what to do with it when it was invented. So it was uh, a solution uh, looking for a problem, but now lasers are of course ubiquitous and we can't imagine modern life or modern communications without them. So I wanted to give some historical context to the development of nanoscience and nanotechnology. So around in the year 400, the Romans um, and their artisans uh, produced this uh, beautiful cup, which is called the Lycurgus cup. And if you look at it on your desktop, you're going to see this, um, uh, uh, the light looks green as it's reflected. If you put a light bulb inside, it looks red. So that was interesting. Why do you get two different colors depending upon where the direction of light is? And then in 1856, Michael Faraday, who's a famous British scientist, was interested in a concept called finely divided gold, and what we, uh, which we now call as uh, nanoparticles, but he kept notebooks of this, as you can see in these uh, boxes. And he was trying to understand uh, what these structures looked like, but the tools were not yet developed. Okay, and then we go to 1959, which was uh, Feynman's famous talk. And then in 1986, the Nobel Prize was awarded for two tools. One of them you've already heard about, scanning tunneling microscopy, which is the top image, to be able to manipulate atoms one by one. And, and then the manipulation of the atoms in, in this way on a metal surface, they were able to create these, uh, what are called quantum corrals, standing waves of electrons. And in the bottom image, uh, the second uh, instrument that received the Nobel Prize in 1986 was the transmission electron microscope. So you're using electrons to image um, materials. And it's these types of materials, it's an alloy of silver and gold that actually are from the composition of this cup. So it wasn't until a long time later that we really understood uh, what was um, contributing to these beautiful colors. In 1996, the Nobel Prize was awarded for the discovery of C60, Buckminster Fullerene. And in the year 2000, um, for the United States, Bill Clinton, uh, President Bill Clinton launched the National Nanotechnology, Nanotechnology Initiative, which provided dedicated funds to the development of the nanoscale tools and materials. In 2007, the Nobel Prize was given for giant magneto uh, resistance. This is again related to some of these magnetic 
properties that was introduced earlier. And then in 2008, a new type of prize uh, was introduced called the, the Cavley Prize. Um, the founder of this prize was interested in highlighting modern uh, advances. And one of those advances areas are in nanoscience. And so the two materials or two structures that were first awarded the, the Cavley Prize is for semiconducting uh, quantum dots, such you can see here, taken by a transmission electron micrograph. And again, these materials are in um, some OLED uh, sort of uh, light emitting diode displays that you can buy from Samsung and LG today. And in the bottom image is a carbon nanotube um, and you can resolve the atomic structure using scanning tunneling microscopy. So the idea of the, the tools and the materials all developing in tandem, it's really uh, an exquisite type of dance. So if we go to the beginning, um, where we talk about nanoscale gold, which I introduced to you in the Lacurgis Cup, as well as uh, Michael Faraday's extensive lab notebooks. And then where do we go today related to what I call the, the nano brick road made of gold nanostructures? Okay, but we have to go back sort of to the very beginnings of it all. And um, unlike you who are have identified that you're interested in STEM and you're, you wanna make connections with um, world leaders and in these areas, I was not that. <laughs> so I was, um, I was on the slow track to, to develop in, in science and I have evidence because my parents recently are um, cleared out their, uh, their storage and they wanted me to just see if I wanted to keep anything or not. And I just came across these um, these old uh, collections that for some reason they kept. And so this sounds pretty good. Uh, dear parents, we are delighted to inform you that uh, Terry Wang qualified for the gifted program by meeting criteria. So it sounds pretty good. But then it's an asterisk. So it's only admitted on a, on a trial basis. <laughs> and that was probably really good reason for this. So um, I can read this here based on the student's involvement. Please circle the number which represents your perception of the following items on a scale of one to six, where one is low. And you see that I have a lot of low scores. So that's not so good. But I persevered. And about you know, six months later, the scores uniformly moved up by two units. So I think that's that was pretty good. And it was enough. <laughs> so um, the, the teacher said that I should be commended for my progress in math, and I should also be encouraged to take higher math courses as I move up into higher grades and, and college. So, you know, you start off a little bit slow, and then you can uh, make some adjustments as, as you go. So we made some adjustments, and, um, and then we did go to college. And college was a very uh, formative time in my life. Um, it was really a time that uh, introduced me to science um, and moreover to multidisciplinary science, meaning all of these different fields all together were going to be really important into making me into the scientist who I've become today. So I went to school at Stanford University and probably the most influential person there was my uh, then boyfriend, now husband. Um, we were married in college. Um, and part of the reason um, he was so instrumental in how I thought about science is he was a year ahead of me. And he introduced this uh, experiment called Young's Double Slit Experiment, which was originally done with light, um, where it was the, an example of how small particles, such as electrons or photons, they can also behave as waves. So light and matter, um, small enough, can have both uh, wave-like properties and particle-like pro properties. And moreover, this experiment was the first beginnings of, of interference and also the quantum mechanical nature of electrons and, and photons. So this idea of trying to understand what's happening at, at small length scales sort of caught me from the very beginning. Um, but then of course, these are great ideas, but then you need to take the courses. And um, I started off as a chemical engineer and so I was taking um, courses uh, by this professor, Professor uh, Reggie Mitchell. He was in the mechanical engineering department. And I remember him quite a bit because I spent a lot of time, like a lot, a lot of time in his office hours. 
And um, he was very patient with me and he basically encouraged me to keep trying. <laughs> Part of me was just wanting to give up the whole engineering track altogether, but um, he gave me a lot of confidence and someone, one of the first professors I think that actually believed in me, which, uh, which meant a lot. Um, the second person that uh, was um, important in my experience was a, a physicist. This is Professor Bob Laughlin. And part of the reason he um, uh, had so much influence is I was a chemist, chemistry major, and then I ended up taking his statistical mechanics course. And then he, um, he was surprised that uh, that chemist <laughs> could do so well in, in the course. So I thought, well, something is going right here. That's pretty good. And then finally, uh, the chemist, chemist, um, uh, Professor Mike Fair, where he gave me a chance. So he had not uh, for a long time had undergraduate students carrying out research in his lab. And he saw that I did well in his graduate quantum mechanics course. And so he invited me to, uh, to participate, which was um, an amazing experience. And so I sort of highlight them as the titles because um, and a lot of the work that we do now, which I didn't know at the time, we integrate all of these ideas, engineering, uh, physics, uh, chemistry, and, and now some biology. And so which led me to uh, back to this quantum corral picture that I showed you earlier, where the scanning tunneling microscopy tip manipulated individual atoms into a ring. So you could see these uh, standing waves of, of electrons. Um, so at that time, I was like, this is really interesting. I'd like to know more, maybe contribute more. Um, and then we had a decision to make. So th the choice was, should we go into the, the Peace Corps right after graduating college, or should we go to graduate school? Um, either one would have been a, a very good option for us. What helped us make the decision was that this was one of the times in recent memories that we the government shut down. And so uh, when the government shut down, national parks were closed, offices to do these uh, interviews for Peace Corps were also closed. And so since we needed to make a decision sooner rather than later, then we went to graduate school. And graduate school also was the, the time that really trained me into becoming a scientist. And so uh, Charlie Lieber was my advisor. Part of the reason I was interested in working with him is because he had built one of these scanning tunneling microscopes and he was using it to um, image and manipulate uh, different types of materials. And my during my uh, second year in, in graduate school, we were able to uh, correlate the atomic structure of single walled carbon nanotubes with their electronic properties. Meaning depending on how you roll up this uh, honeycomb structure, you can have uh, all carbon nanotubes be either a metal like copper or a semiconductor like silicon. And so this was um, unprecedented at the, at the time. And so we wanted to, to learn more about that. So I was really lucky. I was at the right time uh, in the right place and, and the science was just, just getting ready to, to bust out at the nanoscale. Um, but this time was also formative, not just for the intellectual achievements and, and advancements, um, but related to people that had influence on me. And so um, uh, there are all sorts of ways to, to grow as uh, a person. And Dave Schmelzer was the uh, lead pastor uh, of a church that I was a part of in, in Cambridge. And he challenged us to think about um, more. <laughs> How can you contribute? more um, and how can you listen to God on how to do that? So I thought that was um, an important question and something that we uh, still think about. But then you also have friends that are pushing you um, emotionally on how and why do you make the choices that you do and are you going in a right direction for personal growth? So the ability to have uh, a tight network of people that hold held me accountable for things, I think was, uh, really important for, for my development as a person and my development as a scientist. So 
I was about four years into my uh, doctorate, my PhD, and then I was, it was time to graduate and I had no idea what I wanted to be doing with my life. So um, one thing that I had seriously considered was to become a dog walker, partly because I love dogs and I couldn't have a dog where we lived in our, um, in our small uh, condo. And I thought, surely I can do this for a little bit because I didn't have a plan. So it's not, it's not the best option. I tell my own students not to do as I, as I did. And I try to provide them feedback along the way for them to make uh, some informed uh, choices and decisions on their future. But this is, this is where I was late bloomer in this way as well. But then there was an opportunity um, at Northwestern University where I currently am uh, uh, the chair as well as professor, where um, Mark Ratner and, and Chad Merkin reached out to, to my advisor and said, do you have anybody about, you know, almost about to finish up in their uh, PhD that might be interested in becoming a faculty member? And if so, uh, send, have them uh, come interview. And so uh, I did interview and it was not the best interview. Um, I didn't really know much. Um, very, very naive, but um, they were willing to take a chance on me. And it was also something that um, I was quite interested in thinking about in terms of opportunities because I had never thought of becoming a professor. I didn't really like the academic environment. I felt like people were unnecessarily uh, mean to each other. Um, but uh, when I interviewed at Northwestern, it seemed like, and it is true, that people really enjoyed each other's uh, company. So, so we decided to try that. Okay, so Brian is still uh, part of the, the journey, um, journey uh, stage two, we decided to, to try that. And he, he's made different, an interesting choice because um, as I mentioned, he was a year older than me in college. Uh, but he waited for me to, to finish. And then we went to graduate school together. And so when I went to uh, Northwestern, he was willing to have me lead, go first, and then see if he could uh, find a position um, in the Chicago area. And, and he did. He's also a professor of, of physics at Northwestern. Um, so you still need partners and they still keep you honest. Um, and then I had a couple of mentors. Um, and these mentors were, um, they were not the gentle mentors. <laughs> they were sort of very blunt. And, and I think that was important for me to hear at the time, even though it wasn't pleasant, because I knew they were trying to be helpful and they weren't trying to be cruel. And uh, they shaped a lot how I think about science and what types of choices we would like to make. And then I have colleagues at Northwestern um, that have just, they're amazing. George Schatz, Chad, and, uh, and Mark Ratner. And then there are people that help you along the way. And um, this is Dan Linzer, and I call him a helper because he was the provost. And so you always need administrators to help support what the, what the professors want to be doing. So when I moved to Northwestern, I had to learn when to take risks, meaning I was interested in nanoscience. I think I've shown you that already, but I was also interested in photonics. And when I started my career, I had a lot, I received a lot of advice not to take that risk. They told me, you don't know anything about photonics, no formal training, no informal training. Um, and I thought about, a lot about that, but I decided to continue that uh, in this area because I wanted to fail on my own terms. Either it was going to work or it wasn't going to work. Um, and you have no idea if you stay the safe route, whether that will actually bring you to the place that, that you want. So we did it, we did it in, in, in photonics. And so I, we were able to explore ideas like optical corrals. So I showed you those quantum corrals where you saw standing waves of electrons. And uh, my uh, group was able to make optical corrals where you could see standing waves of, of light, standing waves of photons. We've been, we were able to make these uh, nanoscale uh, thin films made out of metal that also have, uh, that are perforated by holes. And it turns out each of these individual holes can squeeze out more light through their holes than the, geome than the geometric um, design would suggest. So it's a phenomenon called extraordinary optical transmission. And that's been really interesting to, to learn about and to contribute to um, sometimes uh, controversial and unexpected findings. 
Um, and this was the image that I showed uh, at the opening slide. We have developed a range of nanofabrication techniques to make three-dimensional structures that can also be functional. And so we have these uh, nanoscale uh, pyramids uh, that you can organize in this uh, really nice uh, uh, array. These structures can also be used as um, particles for uh, imaging and identifying cancer cells. Okay, and then we moved on to uh, what I call Nano uh, 2.0. So we had new additions. This is uh, my son, Bren Odom, when he was uh, just a baby and just a couple of months ago, he's almost eight. Um, and so the family expanded. Similarly, the group family uh, expanded. We had a range of students uh, from applied physics to material science and engineering, to biological sciences, to, to chemistry, a range of students that are contributing to now interdisciplinary research. Um, and it's been a fantastic experience. So we can make structures with higher symmetries that can exist in, in nature for light trapping and solar cell devices. We can make these beautiful nanostars that can be used as um, uh, therapeutic uh, agents as well as a diagnostic particle. And we can also make these types of three-dimensional nano wrinkles that can be used for um, anti biofouling as well as super hydrophobic uh, surfaces. And all of these types of structures are, are possible because you have teams of people that are working together to solve these very complex problems. Okay, so and before I, I finish, I just want to give you two examples of some of the work that we have done with gold because we started out the, the talk with gold and also related to uh, collaborations that we've done. So some of our most meaningful work has been done as part of a team. Uh, and usually the collaborator brings in expertise to solve problems that neither they nor we could solve by ourselves. And these are my favorite types of problems to work on. They're usually complex and they're usually quite time consuming, but overall, um, these are the ones that, that uh, were the most inspiring. So we, we've been working with gold uh, particles and um, using them in different aspects in nanomedicine, whether it's to um, say target, uh, tumors and some type of precision um, therapeutics, or um, like in this image here, to develop um, magnetic resonance imaging probes. And so we worked with um, Professor uh, Tom Ead at Northwestern University on this collaborative project, trying to determine whether if we attach um, DNA with gadolinium chelates, so the gadolinium is responsible for giving you the signal in the uh, MRI. If we attach them to different nanostructures, do we get a, a boost in the signal? So you, do you get higher contrast and more quickly if you were to use these in, in the clinic? And so what's interesting is that indeed you can see, um, at, for example, at the 1.5 Tesla, that you have a very large enhancement if you put this um, molecular chelate on the gold star, which is the primary structure that we work with, versus if you leave them um, just on, on spheres. And so the structure and the shape make a big difference in the design of new types of materials. And similarly, this uh, overall signal is represents an 18-fold enhancement over what you use, um, or if you go to the doctors and you use Prohance, um, what are in conventional uh, uh, MRIs with contrast. So this was a very, uh, fun project and, and we, we learned a lot, both fundamentally and, and in the potential downstream applications. The other area that I wanted to highlight um, is uh, an engineering uh, project. So uh, the MRI contrast agents are more of a scientific project, collaborative project, but we've also been interested in, in lasers. I mentioned that this year is the 60th anniversary of the invention of the laser. And there are a range of different types of lasers that you can see here on the left hand side of the slide. This is a chemical laser. It's very, very large that can fit into a 747. Um, all the way down to uh, these uh, nanoscale lasers that are trying to be as small, for example, as a virus particle. But that's really, really difficult to do. And the way that um, the diffraction limit works is you shouldn't be able to do it. So the smallest lasers you should be able to make are about a micron. Uh, but in some work that we've done related to um, nanoscale lasers, you can see that um, 
this is what a traditional uh, lasing cavity looks like, but this uh, scanning electron micrograph is what our uh, nanoparticle cavities look like. These are super tiny, super tiny particles. And they trap the light and they localize the fields, as you can see in this cartoon, just around the, the particle surface. And so in this way, we can um, achieve the world's smallest lasers, and then we can also control the direction. So in a traditional case, the, the direction is dictated by you know, the perpendicular to the, the mirrors. But in this unconventional case that we have, we don't have any mirrors. And so you can rely on the geometry uh, of, the, of the lattice, uh, as well as the, the constituent materials making up the gain to achieve uh, direction directionality, which is pretty, which is pretty neat. And moreover, if you introduce, uh, put this in a microfluidic channel, you can control the, the wavelength of light that you get out just by keeping the, the nanoparticle structure the same. So it's a very uh, interesting engineering project, but the fundamentals based on how the light is localized to around the particle uh, edges is really important. Okay, and then um, I've been also interested in, in using the expertise that we have for the, the public good. I had an opportunity to write uh, op-eds along these lines, and I was also teaching a, a course at the time. And so we wrote an op-ed on um, why altering the powdered donuts and the powdered donuts and Dunkin' Donuts would be bad for innovation. And so we had discussed this with, my, uh, with the students in this class, and they were freshmen. And this came in the last week of class. And I said, look, you've, you're now the resident experts in, in nano. Would you be interested in writing such an op-ed with me? And so we were able to, was able to train the students in critical thinking skills and scientific principles. And, um, and they agreed to, they would love to come help. And so we were able to publish this piece, uh, which was pretty neat. Um, and uh, with three students uh, contributing to the bulk of the, of the work. I was really proud of them for being able to, you know, they were freshmen, but they were resident experts and they had something to say. And then just uh, going to 2020, where there are new leadership roles as you evolve in your career. So I'm the chair of the Department of Chemistry at Northwestern University. Um, as you know, all in, in not being in school yet, and maybe some schools soon, is that it's been an experience um, related to the COVID-19 pandemic. And, um, and it's been also an experience in trying to lead and provide some stability to organizations uh, in this time. So um, it's been hard, but it's also been rewarding on, on leading a, a very prestigious uh, department. And also in 2020, I assumed the role of chief editor at uh, one of the prestigious journals in nanoscience, it's called Nano Letters. And we also received a, a shout out from um, sort of our competitor, but I feel like we're all part of this uh, publishing community together to be able to, um, to continue to do uh, the best and publish the best work in nanoscience. And so uh, I just wanted to finish up by saying, why, why do you do what you do? Um, this was a question that I thought about. I've, I've thought about it at some point for days, um, but it was part of an exercise uh, we did earlier. And there is this uh, this um, this beautiful song by Debbie uh, Friedman. And I think at the end of the day, um, playing the long game of everything that I've said yes to or no to or made adjustments re related to that was to, you know to be a blessing, to, to give, to make people better around me, <laughs> to, to change them, elevate them um, as part of a community. And that's what I've been uh, trying to do um, in my time here. Okay, so I will stop there. And I hope, I, I know I only left like two minutes for questions, but hopefully that'll be okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Adam. We really enjoyed your listening about your journey through nanotech. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, let me check the YouTube. I just wanted to ask because you said you had a late start to science in general. Like, how did you narrow your focus down to the nanoscale and working down there? How do I narrow it down? Yeah, like narrow, like, oh, I want to work with this. Yeah, I think, I think every, this is where everything matters. So in college, um, 
by taking different classes and engineering science, you know, physics and chemistry by having the breadth of education. And, and then the timing was just perfect because nanoscience is the integration of five to eight disciplines. And so it was, um, I wouldn't say it was a uh, happenstance, but the, the timing was just good. So when I've talked to students about what they might want to be doing with their lives, the, the ability to, um, to be as broad as possible in both science and engineering, as well as in more inclusive in your science. So like getting to know social scientists and how they think about things. I think that's really important because the, the human aspects of nanoscience and the times that you're living in now, you know, it's, <laughs> you can't escape it. I mean, COVID-19 vaccine should not be, uh, it's just, a, it's, a, it's a scientific problem, but it involves humans and, and decisions. And so I feel like if you can start learning about how people are receptive to things, as well as do the best science possible, I think there's huge impact there. And that's what your generation will be able to do. I mean, right now we have to play catch up. Like my generation is like, oh, why can't people just believe in science? But it's not, yeah, it's not so simple anymore. All right, thank you. Oh, there's a question in the chat oh. about Stanford. Would you recommend incoming freshmen? Oh, at Stanford, um, well, Stanford's pretty great because they have, uh, they force you to do this. Like your, your first year, you're in this mixed dorm and you have this great experience and you become very average, <laughs> right? You think you're mostly pretty okay by the time you get there, but then you find out you're just really average. And so by, I think that experience is really uh, important. But the other thing that Stanford does really well is they have a very good um, research abroad program or study abroad program, which I would highly recommend. I ended up doing that um, at Oxford for just a quarter. Um, and that was really important to see how other places do science, which is why, for example, even if you love your state and you love your university, you wanna do training in as many different places as possible because the, everyone's perspectives are just so different. All right, well, if there's no more questions, someone ask if there is a last minute question because otherwise we will move on. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's good to see, thank you, much see so, you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Odom. All right, well, next we have Dr. Stefan Boyer, a Google um, Chem Informatics Science scientific advisor. He is a researcher in the interdisciplinary um, space of chemistry and computer science. He pioneered the use of computers to curate patents and scientific literature in the life of and physical sciences. Other than working at Google currently, his work in the synthesis at, huh? oh. um, at Norvis and in data science at IBM Research. Today, he will help us better wrap our heads around chem informatics and the impact it has on drug discovery and the prediction of new therapies and materials. Okay, hello. Um, let me get this started here. And uh, can everyone see my screen now? Uh, that's, that's, and you can hear me, I'm unmuted. Yes, we can make it to your screen. Okay, so thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to talk about what I do. <laughs> um, so my talk's going to be broken down into two parts. The first part, I'm gonna to try to review um, chemical informatics, some of the fundamentals, uh, primarily because without understanding a little bit of background, then you may not understand what I do uh, in a day to day. But uh, We'll get there together. So um, I was told that I'd be addressing uh, a range of students uh, from middle school to high school. And uh, there are a lot of chemical issues and a lot of ground to cover. Um, I, I thought I'd start with just a simple understanding of the atom because, you know, molecules are made up of atoms. And um, when I went to school, the uh, atom we were considered 
to be basically consisting of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And oops, and that, that was sort of it. And then once when I was at Albuquerque, I went to the Atomic Museum, which I would encourage everybody to go to if, if you get a chance to, the Nuclear Museum. And they had this poster here. And I was thinking about how our understanding of chemistry has evolved. So from this sort of basic understanding of the atom, we've now evolved into subatomic particles and understanding subatomic particles as, as well as, the, uh, as the, the bigger molecules, which we'll get into. But what I was most impressed with is that the size of things. And uh, if, you know, if this is a helium atom and this is the nucleus of the atom, uh, this size, and if this nucleus right here were, let's say, 3.9 inches, 4 inches, uh, or 10 centimeters, then how far away would that electron be that's sitting out here? And it turns out that if this were the size of the nucleus of the atom, that electron would be six miles away. And I thought, wow, you have to think of things in terms of uh, different proportions and how um, that's a big distance between the nucleus and the electron, six miles. And uh, that, that's pretty amazing. And the reason I want to point this out is that uh, as we go down this path of understanding chemistry, uh, you know, it, it, this is sort of the Newtonian view of, of chemistry. And Newtonian physics, we could maybe put a man on the, on the moon with Newtonian physics, but we could not have built a nuclear reactor or, or an atomic bomb with, nu with Newtonian physics. We had to go to quantum mechanics. And so I would encourage the students that as we go forward, realizing that we're evolving in our understanding from this world of, shall we say, Newtonian physics to quantum. And, and this, is, this progression is very uh, obvious in chemistry as well. So let's move on and, and go to a bigger molecule from helium. And let's look at just a simple molecule like ethanol. So I tried to pick a molecule everybody might appreciate. Ethanol is in beer, and you know, uh, if you uh, drink alcohol, it's a in a martini or whatever a gin and tonic. It's uh, it's the active ingredient of of cocktails, you might say. And it, it has two carbon atoms, and <clears throat> you can see here it has a methyl. We call this with three hydrogen atoms. So the white the white are hydrogen atoms. The dark gray are carbon atoms, and this is an oxygen atom. And, you know, ethanol is a pretty cool molecule. You can drink it, you can enjoy it, um, but it's very closely related to methanol, which is the same molecule, but without the CH2 in here. It's one, one carbon less. And, you know, if you drink methanol, you'll go blind. And if you drink ethanol, you'll maybe get high or enjoy yourself or, you know, it has other effects. So there's very dramatic, uh, functional differences between a, a molecule like ethanol and methanol. And this is pervasive throughout all of chemistry. And so how do we, one of the things to understand about chemical informatics is how we go from, whoops, a chemical name, uh, say like ethanol, to this stick diagram uh, or to this uh, ball and stick diagram, we call this. And, and so the in order to do that, you have to take this word ethanol or the word methanol and make it into a machine readable format in order for it to project it as, a, as an actual molecule, what it looks like. So we have to go from the text to the structure. We call that a name to structure uh, algorithm. <clears throat> and, in, and in order to do that, you, you need to have a, a, a fundamental understanding of different formats for machine readable forms of molecules. So in, in, in the beginning, we had something called mole files. So if you took a molecule like benzene and you wanted to make it a machine readable form of a molecule so that you could actually look at it on a computer screen or work with it, um, you had to convert this word benzene into this mole file, which is a three-dimensional description of that molecule. And what this does is it basically says, you know, atom number two is connected to atom number three and atom number one, and it builds a what we call a matrix diagram of, of the molecule. And then 
I'd say sometime later in maybe the 70s or 80s, uh, Dave Weininger came along and came up with a simpler way of defining machine readable forms of molecules, and he called them smile strings. And this is an example of a smile string. And uh, Dave made a huge contribution to the world of chemical informatics because now we could take the word benzene and we could define it as the smile string, put that into a computer, and then actually visualize the molecule in 3D and rotate it and do all these things. So Dave uh, was quite a character. He, and anyway, he lived out in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and bought his own big jet, flew it around, had a great time. Anyway, <clears throat> um, then we, uh, we can, more recently we came up with something called, we needed unique identifiers. And so, because you can have conflicts between smile strings and a group of people got together and they came up with something called INCHIS. INCHIS stands for International Chemical Identifier. And it's sort of like a domain name. Uh, basically, it defines a molecule as here's the molecular formula layer, here's the carbon layer, and here's the hydrogen layer. And we had this bright idea of, of defining molecules as domain names. But then as the molecules got more complicated, again, this is a simple molecule, naphthalene. And here you can see C10H8 is the molecular formula layer. Here's the carbon layer. And here's the hydrogen layer. And as we progress to more complicated layer uh, molecules, uh, introducing things like stereochemistry and carboxylic acid groups and, and uh, 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 radioactive uh, atoms and things like that, we, we had to define more layers. And so you have a charge layer, a stereochemistry layer, an isotopic layer, and a fixed hydrogen layer. And these domain names, uh, uh, or these inchy, inchies, just like domain names can get quite long and complicated. So what people started doing is they took these inchies, uh, which are like domain names, and they put them into a hash program similar to something called MD5. MD5 is an open source hash uh, algorithm from MIT. And if you don't know it, just Google it. It's a very cool algorithm that enables you to take any character string, put it in, and it generates a 32-bit uh, what we call an inchy key, which is a unique identifier. And so that's basically the background. And what I just reviewed with you is several, shall we say, years of chemical informatics. But what you should know is that there's several machine readable formats of molecules. There's a mole file, a smile string, an inchy and an inchy key. And I'll be using those terms. And then you have this ability of going from a chemical name to a smile or, or another machine readable format. We typically use smile strings. And, um, and then you have to have a way of drawing the molecules. And we call those molecular editors. And there's some programs like ChemDraw. There's a, a, an open source one called ChemSketch from ChemExon. Uh, it's called ChemExon Mar Marvin. So if you want, you can download those and, and, and use those to actually draw the molecules. So now we'll, we'll get into the second part of this talk. And that is. Uh, why chemistry? Uh, and chemistry is really, it's been said from a professor from Caltech, it's a, it's a gateway science. Uh, all biology depends on it. Physics sort of depends on it. Uh, material science. And, and, and it's a great way for uh, maybe, maybe a, a lot of things. I mean, molecules, for example, can make money. Uh, so one of the objectives of getting a good education is getting a job and making money. And I just put on here some examples of molecules. And uh, these are the revenues that were made from this molecule in 2019. So in the top, we have some uh, anesthetic molecules. Uh, and as you can see, this simple molecule here made $4 billion last year. Uh, this one made $1.6 billion. So, uh, and then these are some molecules. These are an anti-diabetes drug, respiratory disorder, immunology. So molecules can be very useful uh, for making money. Uh, they're also, in addition to that, they're useful for curing diseases. They're useful for materials, for plastics, energies, batteries, and they impact our lives in every way you can imagine. So a good understanding of chemistry and understanding molecules and what they do is, in my opinion, uh, essential. I put a URL here 
to a uh, work done by a professor at, at, at University of Arizona, where if you click on that link, you can get a poster and that poster will show you every single drug, the top, I'm sorry, it'll show you the top 100 or 200 drugs and it, it'll show you how much money each of those drugs made if you want an example of uh, more examples like what I'm showing here. So now, uh, oh, thank you. Whoop, there were my slides. Uh, okay, uh, there we go. Now, um, another, before we go on to what I do actually, the uh, thing to understand about molecules is they have a lot of attributes. Just like a person has an attribute, they can be uh, tall or short, they can have blonde hair, uh, you know, brown hair, blue eyes, brown eyes, green eyes. You have all these attributes associated with a person. Uh, they could be a football player or a scientist or movie star. Uh, and so, so can molecules have attributes. So they have what we call physical attributes. If it's a solid, it could have a, a, a melting point. It could have a boiling point. Water, you know, water boils and it melts and it turns into ice cube, it freeze it, it turns into an ice cube, it has a melting point. Um, it has a molecular weight, a molecular formula, and so forth. And these attributes can more or less be, these physical attributes can more or less be uh, calculated at this point. They have spectral attributes. Every molecule has a different IR, infrared spectra, a nuclear magnetic resonance spectra, NMR, mass spec, uh, which has its molecular weight, and so forth. And molecules have legal attributes. You know, a molecule is patented and it could be patented as a drug, like the ones that I showed you previously. And that molecule is owned by a company and they own the rights to make money off of that molecule. And so uh, there's the legal status to the molecular, co to molecules. Who, the, who owns it, whether it's owned by a single company or multiple companies, uh, foreign filings, expiration dates of these patents, uh, these are all what we call legal attributes. And then there's also, uh, say, functional attributes. A molecule could be patented as a pesticide or a plastic or an explosive or a refrigerant or a drug. So there's all these functional attributes. So one of the things that chemical informatics tries to do is it figures out uh, what molecules are useful and for what purpose and what are the various attributes associated with that molecule. And just as an example, this is a ethanol going back and this just shows you a spectra. Here's an example of what a spectra, this is a nuclear magnetic resonance spectra for this molecule. So this is just a, a quick example of what a spectral attribute might look like. So if you take this molecule, and you uh, put it in a, in a solution and you put it between two magnets, the electron spin change on these hydrogen atoms gives rise to this spectra and that is very defining uh, the, the, the molecular structure of this molecule. Okay, so now what do I do? So with that background and understanding of uh, the tools of chemical informatics, um, one of the things I'm very involved with is what we call finding dark data uh, for, and using that for scientific discovery. How do you know what molecules have been patented for drugs or for plastics or materials? And so we do a lot of searching. And so the problem is, one of the problems, <laughs> it's not the only problem, but one of the problems is um, how do you keep up with all the publications, the books, and all the materials uh, uh, that are available today? Uh, there's so much, you can't read it all. And so I say it's all content, and no discovery. So the question is, can we use computers to actually read documents, identify critical entities, and perform meaningful associations that help us with our work? And so it's, I say there's gold in them, their documents. The only problem is we can't read them all. We can't read all the books we want to read. We can't read all the journal articles and, and so forth. So can we use computers to do this? So here's a picture of a patent. Uh, you're probably familiar with what patents are. Uh, that's where you can preserve the, 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 the properties of, say, a molecule. And patents have data in them both as text and as images. And so one of the things we do at Google Patents is we use computers to read these documents and extract all the data from the text and extract the data from the, from the images as well. So... Um, 
if I, here's an example. This is a text from a Novartis patent. And if I were to ask you, what is this molecule? This is a rather long, complex uh, chemical name for a molecule. But even people knowledgeable of chemical nomenclature uh, would have a hard time knowing that that molecule is that structure. And so uh, what we do is we use computer programs to actually read this text, understand that this is the chemical word, and put it into a program that will convert that word into the structure. And uh, it has to know that this A is not part of the name, for example. Uh, and that's rather complicated technology. Uh, I won't go into how that's done, but uh, there's a whole two-hour talk on how, the, how that's done. But the end result is we can take a paragraph like this one here, and we can convert that paragraph into a machine-readable form of a representation of what that paragraph says. So here is the, the paragraph to a solution of this was added, this and that, and it's basically a recipe. And what this paragraph, once you put it into these programs, uh, it converts it into these machine readable forms. So we have all these molecules as smile strings or as inchy keys, and uh, we can then put that data into a database. And we can very quickly use computers to look up their spectra data, their melting points, and so on and so forth. And then you run into other problems like, well, what about a molecule like this? This is a, a drug called Valium. And, uh, you know, Valium has a trade name. It has a generic name, diazepam. It has a, a ID number for chemical abstract registry number. And depending on what country you're in, it has 149 names. And so you have a problem with, well, how do you convert all these names? And so that's the idea of using chemical informatics. We can convert all these names into a single structure. And so uh, this is just to give you an idea of some of the different IUPAC names for that same molecule. And they're not at all correct. They're variations of, of the IUPAC. IUPAC mm -hmm. is the Inter International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. But these are the different types of chemical names that people can use to define that molecule. And the poor scientist, he just wants information on Valium, but it's published in all these different sources in different formats. In Medline, the medical journals, they use the word Cetapam or Diazepam. In a patent, they'll use one of those complicated IUPAC names. And chemical abstracts, they use it as a, a refer to it as an ID number. And so uh, by having the, the content, the molecule as a, as a machine readable format, you can actually search across all these different uh, collections that come up with it. So at a high level, how do we do this? Uh, we basically start with a document and we start with identifying the chemical entities. And uh, once we identify those chemical entities, we extract the chemical names selectively. And then we take those names and we put it into what we call a name to structure program. And it takes that chemical name and it converts it into one of these machine readable formats that I described earlier. So it converts it into a connection table, converts it into a smile string or an inchy or an inchy key. And then once you have that as a machine readable form, you can do all kinds of things. And then the next big problem is how do you scale this? So, uh, you know, we take the word value and we put it into a computer and we convert it into a machine readable form. We take the word benzene, we put it into a program and it goes into this receipt machine readable format. And we do this on millions of documents. In 2009, when I was working at IBM Research, we we benchmarked the ability to do a billion pages in three hours. Uh, at Google, of course, we have more computers and we can do this very, very effectively. Uh, and so what we did uh, more recently is we took all the, all the patents from 138 countries. We took all the Google Scholar and all Google Books. And the first thing they did is they put it through a program that Google developed to translate the data from into English. So we took all the Chinese patents, translated them to English, the Russian patents, the Korean, the, the uh, you name it, you pick a language and they translated it uh, into a common English language. Uh, we then did natural language processing, which is what I showed you, identifying selected entities. And by the way, we don't do, do this for chemical names. We extract all the diseases, the proteins, the genes, and so, et cetera. And so we do this name to structure processing. And then we, uh, we map it 
We map the entities as we identify it to, to various ontologies. In this case, it's a it's a ontology concept identifier, gets a unique identifier, gets assigned to everything that gets extracted. And then we put it into, into this great big database in the sky called uh, Google BigQuery. And uh, the database is being made publicly available uh, later this week through NIH. We're actually donating almost 50 billion entities extracted. And uh, thank God they have all the computing resources to do this work. Uh, the folks at Google have been kind enough uh, to support this and, and fund this effort. And so uh, we basically try to identify every molecule on every page of every document, uh, every, every protein, every disease, and, and show for medical subject heading codes. We're, we, because of copyright issues and so forth, we only donate the molecules derived from patents, but uh, it's a very important uh, capability. And now you can actually do go and do structure, substructure searching for any document that contains that. And we put it into this big query environment. Uh, and I think some of the earlier speakers mentioned Kaggle. Uh, you can use Kaggle or Python or SQL structure query language to query this. And in this big environment in the cloud, we not only have all the data that Google's donated, but we have all of PubChem in there. We have Kemble, a uh, lot of different databases. Um, and the idea here is that you can then apply artificial intelligence. You can do clustering, visualization, post-processing, machine learning of the data. So the challenge going forward is we have this environment, which I've quickly tried to describe to you. We have input as, say, smiles or a molecular structure. So you want to put a molecular structure into this, into this resource and you want to be able to uh, semantically map it to all of the other content that that associates that attributes of that resource and you want to output the attributes so put in a molecule and tell me that it's a an adhesive or a cure for a bacteria or whatever uh, or alternatively you have a list of attributes that you want and you say, I need a better adhesive, or I need a better uh, drug for this disease. And you want to put in your, your attributes, and you want to output a list of molecules that would have those properties. So this is the dream. It's not realized totally, but we're on a path to come to this dream. And with that, I think I'll conclude. And if you take away only one thing from this talk, <laughs> take away this list of resources. So if you're at all interested in chemistry or computer informatics, uh, there are these one, two, three, four, five resources. One is Data Warrior, uh, which is probably, it's all free. Uh, you can go to this website and download it. It's by Thomas Sanders, and it's probably the most powerful tool. You can do visualization of molecules, compute its polar surface area. You can look things up. It's phenomenal. Uh, just take my word for it. It's wonderful. Uh, PubChem is a web resource from NIH, National Institutes of Health. You can go to PubChem and you can put in what whatever your question is, is a, is a word or is a smile string, and you can find just about anything there is to find out about that molecule. Uh, Orange is a, is a really cool program for doing data mining. It's, uh, it's from a European university. It's all free. You can download it as a desktop tool and you can spend the next month just looking at videos on how to use it and it's fascinating. Uh, Google Patents, of course, is a resource. You can go there now and you can do structure, substructure searching and find any molecule that was occurred on any page of any patent. And you can download those molecules and, uh, and it's a wonderful resource. And, and then there's Kemble, which is the, I put that in there because it's probably the most used uh, database in the pharmaceutical industry in that it's uh, manually curated and it's very high quality content. I should probably have put in there uh, the EPA database. That's another very good resource. But if you go to EPA CompTOX data, database, that's a, another resource. So I Great. think I'm over. No, you're fine. Uh, okay, uh, I'll stop this presentation. I'm sorry I went so fast, but um, if there are any questions, please feel free to ask. Let me just check the YouTube live stream again in case anyone's on there. 
So a lot of ground to cover. Oh, Dr. Boyer, there's a question in the chat from Evan. Okay. Do, do, how do I get to that? I just click this. All right. Oh, I can just, oh, yeah. Sure. Is MD5 used for one way encryption for passwords? Uh, you could use it, but I don't recommend that. Um, MD5 basically takes any character string and you put it into that program and it creates a 32 bit hash. So you could take your name or you could take your password and encrypt it. Um, um, there are systems where you can put in the, the, uh, the hash codes and their lookup systems, which will do a reverse lookup. So that's one of the risks you run, but it's fun. I mean, you could take like, I don't know, uh, a novel and put the entire novel in and encrypt that entire novel as a 32-bit hash. People are doing this now with uh, uh, DNA strings and protein strings or amino acids and things like that. Oh, Arun also asked, um, how can someone circumvent salting? How can you circumvent salting? Salting. Well, in terms of if you, you recognize a drug, like say benazepril, and it's used as a benazepril hydrochloride. So that's a post-processing issue. And we have tools that will go in and take the molecular content that we've curated through computer curation and we post-process it or you can post-process it and say we want to strip off all the salts and so there are tools available publicly that you can do things like that one of them is a program called knime k-n-i-m-e and you can download uh, these knime protocols and run them over your content and it'll desalt all the molecules and uh, like that. With, with this idea of computer curation, you run into problems of chemical names versus fragments, and it's, it gets rather complicated. I couldn't cover everything, but uh, there is a whole post-processing of the data that has to happen. And I should emphasize that it's not perfect. We get a lot of misspellings. We get a lot of names that uh, we identify as one chemical, and it comes out as another for various reasons. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a messy area, but the, that's the bad news. The good news is uh, it's pretty darn hard to read a billion pages of patents uh, in a few hours. And without this kind of computer science, you know, computer technology, you know, we would not have been able to do that. You'd have to go to a library and start flipping pages. So sorry to cut everyone off, but um, we're a little low on time, so. Uh, Dr. Boyer, thank you so much for your awesome talk. Um, now we're going to have Dr. Vicki Colvin join us. Um, Dr. Vicki Colvin is a professor of chemistry, engineering, molecular pharmacology, physiology, and biotechnology, as well as the director for the Center of Biomedical Engineering at Brown University. Her research interests include um, nanomaterial synthesis, magnetic materials, biologically compatible nanomaterials, and magnetic slash um, electrical imaging in complex environments. So without further ado, please take it away, Dr. Colvin. All right, hi everyone. Can everyone hear me? Good. All right, well, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I Am I the last talk of today, Diana? Um, no, actually, we have talks going until 7 p.m. Oh my but. gosh, all right. So, so maybe you'll get something different out of me. Uh, so what I wanted to do today, um, I thought about where I was maybe at some of the ages that you all are and what questions I had. So I decided to make this sort of personal. And in the next, I guess, 20 minutes, uh, you're going to hear about my research. But I think you're going to hear more about how I got to where I am, if that sounds like a plan. So hopefully you'll learn a little bit, maybe have some questions about the science that I'm very briefly talking about. 
um, but maybe give you some, some insights into some of the ways in which you can develop your career as a researcher. So with that, I guess my question, can I share my screen? Yeah. Great. Okay, so I will pull up my screen. And let's see. Are you seeing a title slide? <laughs> Great. Yeah. All right, so for uh, everyone on this slide too, you know, you might hear me pause. So I can't see my chat, but uh, I'm pretty interactive when I talk. So one of the hard things about Zoom PowerPoints is of course, finding ways to interact. So I'd encourage you to jump in and ask me a question or if, you, if I'm pausing after asking a question, don't be shy. Uh, it'll make it more fun for all of us. So let's get started uh, with what I want to do. So I kind of have three goals um, for today and my time with you. I want to tell you a little bit about why I decided to become a PhD chemist, because there were a lot of decisions I made around your age and a little bit older that um, led me to this path. And of course, the development of the career after that. It's different for everyone who's in, uh, a researcher, but I want to give you my story. You'll hear in that story what I'm passionate about and some of my research directions and how they've changed. And I'll try to highlight the critical decisions that really affected me. Uh, one thing that I remember, and it's still true of my personality, is I always stress about decisions. I wonder, am I making the right one? Am I doing the right things? So it might be interesting for me to reflect on decisions that were really important at the time. They actually did affect me and some of the ones I was stressed out about that didn't affect me. So uh, I'm hoping that could be useful for at least some of you. So let's get started. So this is kind of a path of my life as a chemist. And what I'm gonna do is I wanna start at the very beginning, um, which is actually a little bit younger than all of you, but I think it's important to understand how people got to where they are. Why are you interested in STEM? Why are you thinking about it? Uh, in my case, I was super lucky because when I was six years old, my mother uh, was working at this facility, which is the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Berkeley, uh, not in Berkeley, in Boulder, Colorado. So you can see this big old facility here. And in the 1960s and 70s, um, work here was trying to understand the nature of the ozone hole and other pollutants. It was just kind of the beginning of the chemical understanding of air pollution. So I was a six-year-old kid. My mother was getting uh, her master's degree in chemistry. So what you see here is one of my questions to my mom was, why is the sky blue? Uh, does anybody know why the sky is blue? Anyone want to explain? You can hit the chat if you're a little bit shy. So it's actually scattering of light from the sun off of molecules and particles that are in our air. However, if you really take that far, as my mother explained to me, we would have a purple sky because as the wavelength of light grows very, very short, the scattering process becomes less efficient. So you get more purple light. So the real question she explained to me when I was six is why isn't the sky purple? And that has to do with the absorption of water. So in any case, my mother um, was a very molecular thinker. She was very curious about the world and she's still alive and spending her life teaching uh, freshman chemistry at a community college. So she, of course, was a perfect mentor for me. And I think you'll find for a lot of folks, the role of mentors, whether it's a parent or a teacher in high school, whomever, you really have to identify people to talk to about your path. So I would, um, I would encourage everyone to think about who that person is in your life. Uh, they're gonna become important at different stages. So my mother, I think, really was able to help me understand that there was a much deeper explanation for all of the phenomenon in our world. And in some cases really walk me through it. And so I really have a lot, a lot of gratitude for her setting me on this path. So then I was stuck trying to decide what kind of science and engineering to choose. So this is a picture of Goldilocks and, the, and sitting in the three chairs. So I will hazard a guess that a lot of you are like that too. You like science, you like engineering, and you're not exactly sure the area. Um, so here's some of my observations. In biology, you know, I was taking classes. I, too much memorization. I was fascinated by the questions, but didn't really work with the way my brain worked. Math, I thought was too abstract. Engineering, that's an interesting one. I'm a professor of engineering today, 
But when I was your age, I was too curious about the why. So engineering seemed not as exciting to me at the time. Physics was closer, but it wasn't quite visual and chemistry was just right. In the end, I got a dual degree in the two because I couldn't quite decide. But the point is that I would just make as you're kind of thinking about the area and how you're going to tackle college is whatever you do, don't think you love a subject because of one class. You can always get a great teacher who can draw you in. Make sure you like the subject even when the teacher is not a great match to you, even when you maybe you don't like the teacher. And I think when you get into college, you will have seen enough biology and chemistry, physics, math enough times from different people you'll be able to distinguish subjects that for whatever reason draw you in and other subjects that you're just not interested in. And it's crucial that you figure out that, answer that question yourself. Uh, and that's gonna come through your exposure and courses right now, most likely. So a lot of the advising I do of freshmen and sophomore here at Brown University is sort of listening to which classes did they like, which classes didn't they like and why. Try to take the teacher out of this equation. So lucky for me, I kind of figured out early on, I like chemistry. Biology was, it was really what I thought I was gonna do when I started school. Um, the other thing I'll tell you is I learned also from some experiences in undergrad, I worked in the med school uh, for one of my jobs and I discovered I was just way too squeamish really to do biology for like, especially large animal work. So that was really good feedback. So I was learning about myself most of that happened in my late teens and early 20s, kind of when I figured out the direction. Though I still had a lot of interests, I was able to kind of narrow it down. So then at Stanford, which is where I was an undergrad, I did undergrad research, which is a super important thing to do for me, especially the career I ultimately selected. And I ended up with a double major. I stayed a little longer, partly because I like a lot of different problems. I uh, wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do, so this gave me some info. And what you're looking at on the right is an example of the kind of instruments I was working with. I did surface science with a young professor, and I was able to publish papers as an undergraduate. And for those of you who are thinking about STEM research careers, the most important thing from your college will be your undergrad research um, portfolio, not so much your grades. So it's a real shift from high school where most of you are probably focused on your GPA, getting this very huge breadth of extracurriculars. As you get into college and you get more focused, especially PhD programs are gonna look at how well do you perform in a research environment. And what that means is I had to walk into this lab. Nobody told me what to do. I didn't have a structured plan. I had to figure out with my graduate student uh, mentor a lot of issues about how to make this machine work, how to get data. Uh, so it's a lot more unstructured. It kind of feels like you're, if you've ever gone hiking and you're on a trail, that's kind of like a class. I'd say research is a little bit more like being off in the woods and trying to figure out how to get to the top of the mountain, however you might wish. So it's a kind of different scene. And I loved it. I loved it so much more than being in classes. And that was also really useful information. It solidified my decision to pursue a PhD because that's really all you do in a PhD is research. So um, I was super fascinated. This is a busy slide uh, at this intersection of chemistry and physics. So when a chemist looks at materials, we're gonna talk about them quickly. Uh, we see atoms that get built up into a larger crystalline structure. And so the, the picture on the left is a, mole, a molecular version. It's telling you where the electrons are in this particular molecule. A physicist would instead take a big molecule and imagine it chopped up into little pieces. It's a different philosophical approach. And I was learning in two different classes one semester about actually the same materials, but with completely different points of view. So the physicists were teaching me something called the sort of periodic band potential for describing semiconductors. And the chemists were teaching me something called molecular orbital theory. And I realized after you know talking to the professors and really getting into it, that they were kind of the same. And so I became fascinated at how you could describe the same phenomenon, let's say the color of a material from two totally different perspectives. And that was sort of my realization. I like to work at boundaries between fields. So I went to Berkeley as a graduate student, which is just up the way from Stanford. And what you're looking at is what my thesis was about, which was about nanoparticles. I think you've heard a little bit about them. So on the left is uh, perhaps the most beautiful picture in the world to me, uh, save that of my kids. 
It's a semiconductor nanocrystal. And um, you'll notice that it's got a lot of what look like to be atoms. They're actually columns of atoms. And they're kind of finite. They don't go on forever, like something you could hold in your hand. So the cool thing about nanomaterials is that they're big molecules. They can have thousands of atoms in them. But they're also little tiny pieces of solids. So if you're interested in this interface, you're not going to succeed in nano science unless you can speak both chemistry and physics. So it was really a perfect place for me to work. And it was also very new. It was a new area, very just emerging. And that appealed to me. Over on the right, you see beautiful colors. Uh, one of the first things that people knew about these, my, my thesis was on this, was the fact that the color of these materials didn't depend on their composition. It depended on how many atoms they had. And that was a remarkable finding because up until this moment in human history, the only way we had to change the color of a dye molecule or a solid was to actually change what types of atoms were in it. And this was the first time we could affect that fundamental property simply by the number of atoms, not their identity. And that was super cool to me. That was just, I didn't really care what we were going to do with it. I was just fascinated by how could that be true and how do I dig in and study that? So my thesis work, so that brought me into materials. Now I'm going to skip a bunch of slides here because I'm going slower than I thought. Um, but I will make one pitch for materials that I often do when I teach chemistry. Um, and the reason I like to study materials or why I got into it in grad school, not just nano, it's that I kind of was interested in changing the world. You know, I wanted what I studied to matter. And this is a picture um, from a long time ago of some of the earliest humans, um, you know, hunting a deer. And I always ask students to answer the question, what makes us human? I'll give you a moment to reflect. What makes us human? What makes people different than animals? You can think about that. There's some really good answers to that question. I'm going to answer it. Hopefully some of you may have thought of this is looking at this person here holding something in their hands. What makes humans actually distinct and have allowed us to develop in remarkable ways is actually our ability to make tools. And that's going to depend on materials. So if you look at the names of the ages of people, you have the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age. We name the civilizations based on the types of materials people could make. So learning to make new materials is really amazing. It can actually usher in completely new types of societies. And we can, in a non-science class, argue where that, whether that progress was always good. But nevertheless, it's transformational for our species because with better materials, we can make new kinds of tools. And that's really at the heart, I think, of nanoscience. By ma manipulating materials in new ways, we're going to have new kinds of tools. Um, right now, every cell phone, everything we're using now depends on materials that were made 40 or 50 years ago and the silicon chips that are driving our communication systems. So nanoscience and this ability to make super small materials is kind of, I would argue, the next step. It's a really sh big shift in how we manipulate matter. And that's leading to a lot of changes in things we can do in many different areas, not just one. So you've seen some of this. I'm, these are the ones I'm going to skip. Nano stuff is super small. Uh, my person here is about 10 nanometers. So uh, if it was a polio virus, it would be about the size of a basketball. So actually COVID-19 is about 100 times, about 100 nanometers across. So it's about 10 nanometers, 10 of these people. Um, and a small protein and biomolecules are about the same size as the materials that we make. So that's something else that's cool about nanomaterials. The coolest thing about them, though, is they're really strange. I don't have time to go through this, but when you make materials really small, uh, they often take on properties that are completely different than the bulk material. And I often describe this as micro dog becomes nano cat. So just by, for example, making really, really small gold clusters, I can create really strong catalysts that can actually absorb CO2 from the atmosphere. That's something that the ring you might wear on your finger that's gold can't do. But because it's so tiny, it's super reactive and it has those potentials. So nanomaterials are kind of bizarre in their behaviors, which is why I've been able to spend a career studying them. So. Graduate school at Berkeley. This is a picture looking out over the bay. Um, probably, I did a lot of like 
if you're thinking about graduate school, you'll do a lot of different things in grad school. You'll publish a set of papers. I'll give you one example of some of my work. Um, we were trying to take those little nanocrystals that had size dependent color. And this is a paper that was actually written to describe that they could be light emitting diodes. So basically if we manipulated them into thin films and injected current into those films, the particles glowed. Um, and in fact, when we did that, it was, it was sort of a curiosity. We didn't do it for any applications reason, but the reality is down in the lower left is that actually became the basis. I'll bet some of you have TV sets that now use that technology. So quantum dots are now used as phosphors in a lot of different TVs. It took 20 years for that to happen from the sort of early observations, but the materials because of their small size and stability are incredibly bright. They last a long time and they're much better than the alternatives. So that's really what drove companies to commercialize them. So one of the cool things about graduate work is you never know where it's going to lead. And I never would have guessed at the time that it was 20 years or I would have actually thought it would be closer in 1994. But it took about 20 years for this to develop. And it's not something I did or my professor did. It's something that a company picked up the work and the patents associated with it. So one of the other things I'll tell you about research is you're often given the opportunity to write a patent, you know, which is sometimes good, sometimes bad for researchers. Depends on kind of where you're at and what you're trying to do. But we did write patents on this and, and that was kind of interesting. I didn't make a lot of money out of it, but generally speaking in academic environments, patents are something that the inventors get a share of. It's not always true in companies. So that's something I often tell students who are interested in commercialization or maybe business um, using technology. This is an example. So this was a really fundamental science paper, but it ended up sort of leading to this technology. And that really got me aware that I liked, and this was later, right? I didn't like engineering in classes, but I loved engineering in research, uh, meaning I like to apply things. There's a really good book I'd recommend, Pastor's Quadrant. Um, it's an older book, but it's still very, very good. It describes Louis Pasteur and this concept that when you do research, you can just be curious about the way the world works, or you can try to apply the knowledge to solve a problem. This book argues you can do both by the selection of problems and how you approach them. So this idea of Pasteur's Quadrant is this combination between research and application, which I think has probably defined a lot of what I've done in my, my independent research after grad school. So I kind of learned that applied and basic research is not separate, but you can begin to bring them together. And that's probably, as I said, most of my work is right at that interface. So some other things that I did, so usually after a PhD, which the average time to PhD for most STEM fields is about five years, um, you go off and you do a postdoctoral associate, you become a fellow somewhere, you're not a prof, you're not independent, it's kind of like being a teenager, actually. <laughs> You're kind of in between. Uh, and I did that at a place called Bell Laboratories. And I did something totally different. I did some more optical materials. I worked on holograms. And uh, I'm giving some examples of companies here. If you know about the 3D goggles, actually Microsoft and Apple are sort of coming out with a sort of full view holo holographic projection. It's sort of based on some of these early materials work about light reactive polymers. So some of that work is translated as well, which is exciting. Although at the time, the work was extremely quantitative model, right? That was pretty fundamental work, but it had this link 10 or 20 years later. Um, a little bit about independent research, and this is gonna go fast because I'm almost out of time. Um, I would define research as the creation of new knowledge. And I hope that all of you get excited about that because it is a real privilege to be able to do it. It means that if you engage in this and develop yourself as a researcher, whatever the area, you will actually create knowledge that will change the world in important ways. And I think that that's one of the most exciting things about what we do is this, this concept that the knowledge that we create in the STEM fields has such broad significance, whether it's for policies, how we operate in the world or technologies that may get generated. But it's a very creative process. It's very unpredictable. It's very risky. It doesn't always work when you're going off to do experiments. Um, but at the end of the day, it is the act of creation. So um, it's something that I think a lot of times in a STEM class you don't appreciate. 
Uh, but once you get into a laboratory doing research, you get it. You're like, oh yeah, they don't really know what's gonna happen. <laughs> they might have a guess, but uh, you have to go and figure that out. So it's a very exciting thing to do. Uh, every, every, you know, couple of months, everything is new. <laughs> So I'll tell you a couple of the problems. So when you start as a prof, um, so I took an academic route, even though my postdoc was in industry. Uh, and I did that for reasons you can ask me about, but um, it was the right choice for me. Uh, and when you're a professor, it's kind of like your job is to study thing, anything you want. <laughs> and in fact, at the schools I've been at, Rice University and Brown University, um, really the research was a big part of what I did. I taught and I love to teach. But really, it's the training of new researchers in my field of chemistry and engineering uh, and the generation of new knowledge and new capabilities. So I started off, I was fascinated by this. I don't know if anybody knows what this is. It's a morpho butterfly. And it's unusual because it's blue. Blue is a hard color in nature. Dye molecules that are blue break apart. This butterfly is blue because not of a dye, but because of diffraction. <laughs> so if you were to zoom in, you would see there'd be little lines and those lines basically reflect light at very particular wavelengths. They reflect very, very well blue light. So it appears blue to you. So it's a totally different way of uh, manipulating color in nature. So I got very interested in this concept of diffractive materials. Uh, we did a lot of work on, um, in my younger years on studying them. This is an example you can see in the background. This is a scanning electron micrograph, a lot of balls all close together. And again, I guess I do a lot of things that have color. <laughs> we were manipulating color, but in different ways. So that's an example. And I chose this problem strictly based on curiosity. And like many of those questions, you find applications later. Uh, I also am passionate about the environment and I want to improve it and I want to protect it. So um, we started to do a lot of work on nanoparticles and environmental systems. And one of the things that's very interesting about nanoparticles in the environment is there's a lot of natural nanoparticles that are crucial for environmental processes. And the understanding of that requires nanoscientists to sort of make model systems and understand, okay, how does this piece of rock actually filter water moving through it? So that's another area we've operated in. We've applied those materials to water treatment, among other areas. Uh, and of course, biology, um, even though I found it really boring as a student, because I just didn't want to memorize things, I find it absolutely fascinating now. Uh, so we do a lot of work in biomedical engineering. Uh, this is sort of the early days. In fact, this picture I used to make fun of because it shows little nano robots that are affecting red blood cells. And the first thing I'll tell you is if these were really nano, they, you probably see them like a little speck. But this is actually not my own research, but people are actually becoming amazingly good at building self-propelled nanoparticles that actually can interact with biological systems. Our work's been a little bit more focused on fundamentals. I'll give you an example, um, how we can image and watch physiological processes by tagging. In this case, you're looking at a worm that just ate one of those quantum dots, and you can see the gut of the worm is all lit up uh, with the quantum dot. And through this, you can actually study some very interesting questions about um, how organisms manipulate and use inorganic materials. Um, so a little bit, and I'm about to close. Um, last three years at Brown, what I've been doing, um, a lot of problems related to fundamentals of protein nanoparticle interactions. Uh, we do a fair bit of MRI imaging right now. It turns out nanoparticles are small enough to interact and get into the human body and a lot of different tissues, and they can be used to light up, for example, where there's a tumor and also be used to treat those tumors. And of course, I've uh, had a, an ongoing interest in water and uh, how to both detect contaminants in water and remove them using these super small materials that have really, really high surface areas. I want to end with the last pit of my, my, my job, and this is very late, so it may not speak to all of you, but some of you. And that is whether or not you want to think about leadership and how you think about that as you develop as a scientist. So one of the things that's defined the last 10 years of my career has been a lot of roles in various administrative posts. You can think of it principal, assistant principal of a high school, kind of like that. Still doing research, but also that. So why? Why would I do that? So what you're looking at is an atomic force microscope, one of the instruments we use a lot. And uh, when I was a professor, 
very young, I wanted to use this instrument, but I couldn't get access to it. I wasn't allowed to use it at the university, which really affected me. And in fact, it made me really angry. <laughs> so I used that anger, you know, and I complained to people. And what I learned in this process of trying to change the university, so there was equal access to some of these amazing uh, pieces of equipment for all labs and all students and all professors, was that it's very gratifying to actually make positive change in the world, whatever the scope is, whether it's your university or your classroom or your family. So I would encourage you as you develop to find ways to lead. Um, leadership in science and engineering is about people like it is in any area. And it's super important that um, scientists and engineers step up to those roles. Um, and I would follow your passion. Usually for me, I know I'm going to take a leadership role if I'm frustrated or angry about something. Uh, that usually propels me to um, deal with some of these much, much more difficult problems. I mean, it's one thing to do hard science. It's tough, but boy, it's lots tougher to try to actually make change with people. So I would encourage you, though, to always keep that in mind and look for places to practice uh, those skills and flex those muscles. So with that, I hope I've told you a little bit about research. I'm happy to talk to you more about any of it and uh, take any questions you might have. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Colvin. Um, we're still a little bit behind schedule, so if anyone has any questions, um, shoot them now. Oh, someone asked in the chat, in what ways does your field compare to other forms of material science? Great question. So nano is, um, I would say very, it's a subset of material science, also kind of a subset of chemistry. I'd say if you become a material scientist, you have um, more, usually more engineering. You think about big solids. So you, for example, would understand semiconductor manufacturing. You would have a, a view of almost any material. I think nanoscience is a subset of it. It's also a subset of chemistry, materials chemistry. And it probably is a little bit more molecular. Often a material scientist would not be as well versed in chemistry. Most nanoscientists either have a direct chemistry background or um, a closely related you know, molecular view. So that's a good question though. Um, nano is kind of embedded in a lot of things now. It's kind of like polymers. So you can think of it as a broad class of materials Although any material can be made nano, you can make a nanopolymer, nano semiconductor, you name it. As someone asks, could nanotechnology be used to alter genetics? Yes, it could. I'm sure you probably today have heard a little bit about CRISPR. So um, one of the challenges with um, in vivo manipulation, so in a, in a human, having a way to manipulate a system uh, is, is a challenge. So one way you can use nanomaterials to basically deliver CRISPR editing is the nanomaterials are wrappers, smart wrappers for the machinery you need to get into a cell. So that drug delivery element of nano is, uh, you've got to make the, the, the package nano. If the pack is too big or too small, it's a problem. The other, and I have a collaborator here, Chris Moore is a neuroscientist, where it's an amazing idea, is to use light. So if you can in, like, take a cell and actually shine a certain type of light on the cell, you can actually engineer that cell to turn on a very specific gene. Let's say you might want to have it make a growth factor that would you know, ease inflammation in the surrounding area. So that optogenetics component is actually something that's been developed. You can make light sensitive systems biologically. The problem is getting the light in. So the nanoparticles can be used to be up, what's called an up converting phosphor or a very small material that is like a little beacon that when it finds the right cell, it lights it up and those genetic pathways are turned on. So that's another example. So I'd say one is sort of just drug delivery in some sense, and then the other is really utilizing the unique optical properties of nanoparticles. All right, there, there is a few more questions, um, but I know Dr. Colvin, you said you have to go. 
And we oh, also I, have... I know you're behind oh. schedule. I'll see about getting to the chat um, myself and answering them. But oh, thank yeah. You for the questions. I know Zoom PowerPoints are, are really difficult. So I appreciate everyone. It was really uh, a pleasure and good luck to all of you and have fun. You've got, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to become a researcher and to operate in STEM. So good luck. And I'll go Thank to the Thank you so chat. much again. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, so our next speaker event is going to include Dr. Fromer, which you hopefully, who you hopefully remember from earlier. Um, and this time we're going to be joined by Jennifer Swanson and Jed Doherty, um, who are the co-hosts of the Solve It For Kids podcast. Um, Jed Doherty is also the host of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Um, and he's a motivational speaker, anti-bullying expert, educational magician, and a children's book author. Jennifer Swanson is also an award-winning author of over 40 plus nonfiction books for children, mostly about science and technology. And she has also presented at the national NSTA conferences, the Highlights Foundation, and um, many other prestigious conferences. Jennifer Swanson is also a chemist um, and educator. So please welcome our amazing podcast hosts and guests, um, as they dive into Dr. Fromer's life as a scientist. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Jennifer Swanson. Um, and so let, let me correct, I'm not a chemist. <laughs> I, I got my bachelor's degree in chemistry a long time ago. Um, I now teach middle school science to um, for Johns Hopkins University Center for Talented Youth. So I have a master's degree in K through eight science education, but not a chemist, <laughs> um, children's book author. And I'm having tons of fun with Jed Doherty. And we created this cool podcast for kids. It is a lot of fun. And I, Diana, thank you so much. You made us sound yes. like really fancy. And I know, right? Especially <laughs> I me, like, I'm not used to that. Yes. So, so what is our podcast? It's called Solve It For Kids. And this is sort of a thing that I've been thinking about because I've been writing books for about 10 years and I've been able to talk to some amazing researchers um, in all of the books that I've done. And, and by the way, I'm writing down everybody's name today. So, you know, you'll, you'll be getting emails from me. No, I'm just kidding. Maybe not. Um, anyway, the cool thing as you guys have been listening today is you know, a lot of people think about scientists and engineers as kind of very staid people, right? They just, they do their job and whatever. But when you hear them talk about what they're doing and what they're researching, they are so excited. And that's something that I wanted to share with kids. And Jed and I have been doing podcasts for a while for a, a program I called STEM Tuesday. And Jed felt the same way, right, Jed? Absolutely. And it's really been exciting. Again, I'm not being in, in the STEM fields myself, I had that image of, you know, the scientists, you know, kind of quiet and stay by themselves and spend time in the lab. But everybody that we've had on has been so engaging and so excited. And they just love sharing their ideas. And they love talking to young people through our, our podcast about what they're doing and helping because they know that the work that they're doing right now it's going to take a long time to finish. All right. But I it's going to change the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about it. All these things that everybody's doing is, is changing the world. And that's what we're trying to do with the podcast is get the kids excited. Like you guys are all excited about science and STEM, but we're even shooting for a little bit younger, um, like maybe 10 year olds and up to get them really interested in science and not just have it read it in a textbook. Right. That's kind of boring. Mm -hmm. So what our podcast does is we saw, we ask, um, scientists to come on and engineers and solve a problem. So Dr. Frommer has been uh, very nice to volunteer for us. We're going to kind of do like a little mini Solve It For Kids With You Guys podcast today. And we're going to talk to Dr. Frommer. And we're going to, let's see, we, we'll let you pick which problem you'd like to solve, Dr. Frommer. You're probably like, oh, geez, what do they have for me? <laughs> So the question is, would you like to solve the problem? How do you inspire kids to get to follow STEM careers? Or would you like to solve the problem? How do you do, become really good at science communication? Like explaining what you do and bringing it to a level that everyone can understand. Which one would you like to solve? Both. Both. Oh, okay, Both. cool. Well, there you go. We'll we're, do both. We're, so we're going to let Jed do his really exciting lead in 
um, to get everybody amped up because if you listen to our podcast, you'll see that we are very high energy and then we're going to get to it. All right, here we go. Let's see if you guys can hear our introduction here. This is Solve It for Kids. <laughs> hey, everybody. My name is Jed Lee. So great to see so many bright and curious people here in our audience today. This is Solve It for Kids, a podcast that gives kids and families a look behind the real world of scientists, engineers, astronauts, aquanauts, and really wicked smart people and solve problems in their jobs using curiosity, cooperation, and critical thinking. Right now, let me introduce our co-host, our dean of all things, Stim and Steen, Jennifer Swanson. Hello, Jed. I am so excited for today's show. We are going to talk to Dr. Jane Frommer, and she is going to help us solve the problem of how do you inspire kids to, to want to get into STEM fields? And also, how do you take, if you're a scientist, how do you talk, um, take your science communication and get it so that everybody understands? So welcome to the show, Dr. Frommer. Hey, <laughs> it's great to be here, guys. I'm looking forward to chatting with you. I know you're going to ask some great questions. <laughs> so by the way, it wasn't really a choice between the two. The two are kind of one and the same. So they uh, are. I don't mean to be challenging you. Oh, no, we're, we're good. And we keep everything, as you'll see, and everyone will hear from our listeners, where it's just we're having a conversation. So for those people who may not have heard your talk before, give us a little uh, intro about what you do specifically um, so everybody can start from the same page. Happy to. Um, so I do what's now called nanotechnology. It wasn't called that when I first got started. I'm trained as a chemist, as an organic chemist in particular, who turned into an organometallic chemist, which is to say taking carbon molecules and fooling around with metal atoms together. And uh, because of the research environment I was in with physicists and engineers, they were building cool instruments. But in my opinion, they weren't doing such cool things with them. They were kind of looking at boring materials. They were looking at silicon crystals, which granted silicon is very important these days in our semiconductor societies. But having a background of a chemist, I said, you know, you could take some of these cool instruments and find out all sorts of neat things about molecules, ah, which physicists and chemists say, you want me to put that in my machines? <laughs> <laughs> sometimes call it dirt and they sometimes call it chicken fat. Well, but see, that's the cool thing. And, and this is what some of the people that we've talked to, some of the other scientists is, is it's not always straight up science, right? Sometimes you, you actually use your backgrounds to come at things in a different way. Right. And, and it's something that people may not have thought of before. That's really cool. And that's something that kids can learn about science, too, I think. Absolutely. I probably talked to maybe, let's say, of 10 people who had these new instruments that Dr. Colvin just talked about. Also, these scanning probe instruments right. of 10 people I talked to, nine of them looked at me like I was crazy at <laughs> suggesting that I put my molecules in their pristine instruments. But it took perseverance to find that 10th person who, um, okay, maybe we can try this. And we got that eureka moment together. I'm, I'm wondering, Dr. Jane, is that must be somewhat intimidating when you're, you're a, a scientist and you have this idea and it's really, really out there. Where do you find the courage to kind of go out there and present it and, you know, go against the tide and say, no, 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 look, this is, give it a shot. You're right, it is intimidating. And I think the reason it's intimidating is because we're afraid to look dumb. We're afraid to look <laughs> stupid if we go against the mainstream. And so I think that what really helps is to have a, as much self-confidence as you can muster that even though that question might be naive in their environment, you come from a background or a different training or a different expertise where it's not that dumb a question. And so find some excitement in that meeting of you're thinking something's a good idea and they're thinking it doesn't fit into their world. Right, and and I think, again, that's also something that kids can learn from. And, you know, I mean, I have students that I tell the same thing to because 
um, they might have an idea that comes at something differently. But I like to tell my, my students, there's no such thing as stupid questions. Um, there are questions that I don't know the answer to, and that's okay. <laughs> but there's no such thing as a stupid question. So yeah, that's, I think that's a great thing for kids to learn. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Sometimes I'll ding a kid saying, well, did you really think before you asked that question? And let's together think through that right. question. What is it we really want to answer here? Or what can we discover in that question? And sometimes that just kind of encourages or challenges them to think through a little bit more, be a little bit more analytical about a situation rather than throwing something out with a chuckle and thinking that there. <laughs> in fact, let's think this through a little bit more because there might be a really good idea behind here, but we haven't gotten to it yet. Let's get to it together. That sounds really exciting. And it must be really um, gratifying to you when you finally make that breakthrough and you're able to communicate your idea and get other people to not only listen, but to implement it. I think the best way to do that is to connect into stuff they already know. In fact, I think that's the basis of teaching anything new is to tie into what other people know. I'd love to give an example that I use in my lab for why we like to use some of our instruments to look at single molecules. The man on the street might say, well, so you got one molecule, you got 10 molecules, what's the big deal? Right. Here's the big deal. It's kind of like sociology. Groups of people behave differently than single people people behave. They oh, react to situations differently. For example, let's go back into science. If you wanted to boil water, you would fill a pot and you'd heat it to 100 degrees centigrade. Mm -hmm. That gives enough thermal energy so that the molecules begin to tumble about and boil and eventually evaporate if you forget to turn the stove off. <laughs> What's happening at 100 degrees centigrade? You're giving enough energy to that water to break the bonds between the water molecules. They're no longer hydrogen bonding to each other and they're flying out of the pot because you've given them enough energy to fly out to break the bonds between them. All righty, so you got one molecule. How hot do you have to heat it to cause it to fly out of the pot? Oh, that's a good question. Isn't that a good one? So what bonds are you breaking if you have a single molecule to cause it to fly out of the pot? Now, some people might say, well, you have no bonds to break because there's no other water mo molecules around it but that that causes you to then think a little bit more, but what is around it? Well, in fact, it's sitting on the bottom of the pot. So you got to right. break the bond of the water molecule to the pot. And if that pot has a Teflon coating in it, then you're breaking a water Teflon bond. That might be a different energy than if that water molecule sitting in an aluminum pot, in which case you're breaking a water aluminum oxide bond. So the answer to the question of how hot do you have to heat a single water molecule to get it to boil is, it depends. Oh, and that's good. But while you're doing this, of course, you know, I'm a children's author and I'm also a teacher. So I'm imagining you could actually set this up in a classroom, right? Like you make all of the kids different molecules and bonds or whatever. And you talk to them about being in groups versus being singly and all this kind of stuff. And right there, you have explained a very complex science topic to the kids who you could maybe do this, I don't know, as young as seven, you know, seven, eight years old, you can get them to understand different things. And isn't that kind of, like we said, solving the problem for how you teach science and do science communication to kids? That, that's a great idea. You're using their, uh, their physical beings as your demonstration. But as you said, because you said it first, use something that they understand and that they know if they know groups versus single dynamics. So right there, you did a great job. Look at that, solve the problem. That, that's true. Can I give another example? Of Absolutely, yeah. You're, you're on a roll there. <laughs> I'd like to talk about phase changes in front of classes, particularly high school. And because it sounds like big words, but what we boil down to is playing hockey with dry ice. Oh, wow. I like that. That's a yeah. great analogy. Yeah. So we talk about going from a solid to a liquid as you put in more energy and then finally boiling when you put in more energy. And then, of course, we always throw in the exception of that word that a rock band named itself after. Sublimation. Oh, OK. okay. I was like, I knew the term, but I don't know the rock name. <laughs> sublime in fact well and then now that i have the word sublime out there i take out the dry ice and every desk gets a piece of dry ice and we play hockey with it and they see and we also i also put an eraser on each desk and say let's play hockey with the eraser too and 
and then let's decide which is more fun. Man, where were you when I was taking chemistry or when I was taking science? That's, you sound like an amazing teacher. <laughs> Well, this is the idea to tie into something that they've seen. They've seen an eraser, they've seen a pencil. They mm -hmm. maybe haven't seen a chunk of dry ice, but actually a lot of them have seen dry ice these days. And to talk about why is it more fun to play with that chunk of dry ice? That dry ice is actually not touching that surface. It's floating. It's floating on a bed of carbon dioxide. So we can talk a little bit about that or it's floating on a little bit of water. And then we can get off on other topics like friction. What is friction and how is that being demonstrated here? And how does a pencil eraser work anyway? And does it really remove lead? And wait a minute, lead? Is there lead in that pencil? And so it, you know, it leads to so many wonderful circumstances in their own lives that they have in their own hands that you can then act as a jump off point to talk about the science behind it. And that lights them up because they can take that home and they can talk about how they played hockey and maybe they'll be able to talk about sublimation, but maybe they won't. It doesn't really matter. The fact of the right. matter is you excited them with science that day. Yes. I'm wondering, Dr. Jane, I understand why it's important to, uh, to, to talk to kids who are interested in science and communicate these, these important ideas to those kids. But it must also be important to communicate ideas about science to the general public, people who aren't necessarily interested in science and don't understand a lot of basic stuff that these kids here understand. Why is it important for young scientists to think about being able to communicate to the general public? Actually, those two experiments I just mentioned are the dry ice experiment I do in classrooms where kids haven't a clue what science or engineering oh. is about. So that is really an example of getting them to think about the fact that science is all around us all the time. And, you know, and to that end, I often find that introducing the idea through engineering rather than science is a little bit more effective because you can point out so many things around them that have been engineered that might be of interest to them. If they're in high school, they like to know about cars. They like to know about fuels. They like to know about new sports equipment that maybe has carbon nanofibers in it. Okay. Um, you can even get a little bit gross and ask why would, when they flush their toilets, it doesn't come out in their sink. And that's because <laughs> of civics engineers and fluid uh, dynamics. And someone is thinking and caring about these things in their life. It's not just happening and it, it's being engineered, it's being designed. Now, sometimes I will then go on and say, so what's the difference between a scientist and an engineer? Mm. A scientist asks why and an engineer asks how. That's a little bit trivial, but it then acts as another springboard for how they work together in solving problems, but how engineers can bring you to solutions by being creative. Well, and so some of the people that we have interviewed, um, let's see, uh, Dr. Mark Patterson, his interview has not been up yet, but sometimes scientists, because he um, works in un, under the ocean and whatever, and he needed to develop his own remote, remote operated vehicle, his our own ROV. So he kind of became, learned how to become an engineer to create the tool that he needed in order to study the science that he wanted to learn about. So I'm one, that's what, that's why I love what you were saying about scientists and engineers. To me, they seem, in some cases, they're, it's the same person, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes they just work in tandem with each other, but it's very, very close there to figure out what you're trying to do. Um, and and like, I agree with you about engineering. And, and that's why a lot of the books that I write are way more technical and engineering because that's what draws me into uh, material science and all that kind of stuff. I've, I actually have a book on nanotechnology called Super Gear, which is about sports and nanotechnology. Yes, um, yeah, you gotta tie into areas of interest and then use them as the catalyst for going in deeper, but you gotta hook them with areas of interest. Um, you know, there's nothing that gives a scientist more admiration for an engineer than trying to take your scientific idea to fruition or to the public or to demonstration. <laughs> and then you really appreciate the skills that they're taught. Oh, absolutely. They know, how, as you say, they know how to make it into action sometimes. Um, but yeah, that's. I think that's great. Scientists and engineers should work closely together. Absolutely. This is uh, it, it, exciting for me to be here because I'm learning so much. I mean, you know, through Jennifer's book, I when, when I heard the word nanotechnology, I thought she was saying nanotechnology. I thought, what, technology grandmothers use? I'm, you know... <laughs> 
I want to do a riff on that. In fact, <laughs> early in the days of nanotechnology, the public had a very fearsome response to it. They pictured these little bots that were going to go and eat them up and destroy oh, them. Oh, yes. And yes. Um, what I'd like to do is say, you know, you've been surrounded by nano all your life. You just haven't been aware of it. There's really no novelty. There's no impending danger here. What maybe has changed is we have a little more control over materials on that scale. But in fact, you're surrounded by things on the nanometer scale. In fact, you are composed of things on yes. the nanometer yes, scale. Yes, you are. <laughs> so it is nanotechnology in some way. It's your great, 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 great nanotechnology in that we really are surrounded by nanometer scale things, molecules in particular. That was the basis of my talk. So I like your uh, mentioning nanotechnology. It's, it's well yeah. taken. Yes, bad dad jokes. That's my specialty. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Nana, it's, it's exactly like you said. And I also love what you said. Science is all around you. That's actually one of the things I tell students when I go to schools and talk to them or I talk to my own students is that science is everywhere. It, 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 you can't live basically without science because you are science. I mean, everything that you're I'm made really up of. Science. It's true. Um, so it's, it's an amazing thing to, to tell kids. Okay, so what else we have? Oh, how else would you inspire kids to follow STEM? So if say you have a kid that's, eh, we sort of like it, but it's not great. What would you say to that kid? Well, again, I'll speak from my own experience and in working with kids, particularly who are from communities where maybe their parents or neighbors don't work with science related or engineering related fields. I would take them into a scientific environment if possible. And a, a laboratory, it doesn't have to be a basic research lab, it can be applied research. And you just see their eyes widen and widen. Yes. And then definitely make the point that that could be you sitting in that chair and there's no reason why it can't be you sitting in that chair. Uh -huh. Yeah, you gotta take math classes, that's usually required, but now you understand why you gotta take math classes. So you can be sitting in that chair doing those neat things too. So it's that old adage of a picture says a thousand worlds. Just put that vision in their mind that they too could be doing what they think is neat in other people. That could be them. Well, and, the, and I think that's what Jed and I are trying to do with the podcast, right, Jed? We're trying to get kids to hear from real scientists and engineers and, and be able to close their eyes and imagine themselves doing this. Um, some of the people that we've talked to are, and Jed, you can help me go through it. We've, we've interviewed Fabian Cousteau, um, Katie Coleman, an astronaut. She talked about how to live in space. Um, but we also talked to Shaw, uh, Shaw Selby. I'll say his name, Shaw Selby, who what created his own job, created right, Jed? Own, yeah, yeah. He, he decided that he was going to be a conservation technologist. And then he had to figure out what that was. And now he has his own job and he loves it. He loves and, it. and he started out as what well, I think a mechanical engineer. A and then scientist. yeah. And then he decided and designed rockets. And then he decided he wanted to work in conservation because he was very um, passionate about saving the world and so forth. So he basically created his own job, mm -hmm. um, which is also a cool thing that kids should be able to hear. And all of you should, you know, just because it's not on the syllabus or it's not in the, the college university, you know, listed as a major, doesn't mean you can't do it. I mean, even Dr. Jane said that you, you kind of just say, hey, let's think outside the box here. Yeah. And Dr. Jane, one of the things that I really love uh, that you said was, especially giving, giving kids a chance who come from circumstances where they're not exposed. They don't have moms and dads who went to uh, university or are in the STEM fields. They don't know anybody in the STEM fields. And they, you know, they're, they're surrounded by people who are telling them, no, nah, you can't do that. That's not for you. People from our neighborhood, they can't do that. And I really think that there's, I know that there's a lot of really bright kids in those yeah. communities that we need to lift up because they have some great ideas that are going to really change the world. We need to lift up as their, their neighbors, their um, yeah. people in the community. Teachers are, I find, the other half of the equation in terms of lifting them up. And, and I mentioned that from the point of view of some of our listeners today, consider going into teaching. Yeah. I know that it seems like uh, maybe more glamorous life to become a researcher, and it, it isn't always glamorous, by the way, I could be down <laughs> 
but also consider becoming a teacher, going into teaching, uh, maybe even a hybrid if you really feel like you want to stay a uh, stay a researcher as well. It's so important that both the teachers and the researchers inspire students from the point of view of yes, you can. This is what you got to do. You got to work hard. You can't blow off the math. Just stick with it. You know what I'll sometimes do in the classrooms is I'll correlate math backgrounds with the amount of money you can make in a job. Um, and I pulled this data off the web, but you sort of correlate the amount of math it takes to be selling hamburgers at McDonald's versus being a bank teller versus being a nurse versus being a lawyer. Well, maybe not a lawyer, an engineer perhaps. And so there's, you know, whether you want it or not, there is a correlation typically between the amount of math that you studied uh -huh. and the amount of money you make with that job. So I, I generally encourage them to take as much math as possible, asking them, does it cost more to take more math classes in your high school, junior high? And of course they'll admit that it doesn't. Also, they <laughs> it well, it might be more like, well, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I get. I guess I could take calculus if I really have to, or or, or the trigonometry or the geometry. But as yeah. long once it gets on your CV or in your your school records, future employers will look and say, "Hey, you know, if that person did that much in math, maybe I can help them. Let them help me with the monthly budgets, or something like that." It uh, it's a topic that's worth investing in. Uh, uh, it, it's well, hard, and well, I also tell them that if they aren't getting it in math classes ask someone else because <laughs> as as many different kinds of learners as we are some of us are visual learners some of us are tactile learners some of us here learn better by hearing teachers are very different too and so yes. don't hold it against that particular teacher if you're just not getting it ask two or three other people to explain the same thing to you and chances are you'll get a very different perspective or explanation certainly yeah. don't go away saying i don't get it and just cash out at that point no be persistent and in my house, um, I am the science background. My husband was the math major. So the, my, my children knew to go to him for the math, the calculus, the differential equations, integrals, all of those make me go. But, you know, I yeah. survived math and I also survived um, three years of engineering at the Naval Academy. So well, sometimes it's how much you know. And then getting back to your original point, sometimes it's just how you communicate it. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, so this, I think we're getting close to the end and I, I don't know if we're going to have questions. We can see if, if anybody has questions, but, um, thank you, Dr. Jane, for being on with us. I think this was a really fun, just kind of little mini version of our solve for kids. What do you think, Jen? Absolutely. Dr. Jane, you are fantastic. Thank you very much for being with us today. And if you want to check us out, um, we do have, you can find us on, uh, let's see iTunes, uh, you you say it. Where we, are we? <laughs> we are on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, Ghana, this giant Spotify in India. Uh, Podchaser will be on iHeartRadio soon. We're all over the place. But the best place to go is to solveitforkids.com because we have links to all of the shows there. We have links to our uh, where our show is on those different platforms and also a lot uh, a lot of information. One of the things that our regular guests do is at the end of every show is they give us a challenge. They, they give us a challenge and it can range from uh, Katie Coleman, NASA astronaut, challenging us to go out and see the International Space Station in the sky as it orbits over us. And then we recently had a civil engineer, Tamika Grimes, um, challenge us to go out and find two straws and make a hypothesis, uh, which is going to flow quicker through the straws, some uh, re regular tap water or some oil. Uh, and, and just really neat challenges like that. And so. You know, it might be something that's that's a little bit below what kids in high school are doing, but if you have younger siblings or nieces and nephews or friends who are going crazy being locked up here since March, <laughs> this could be a great way to spend some quality time with them and getting them uh, interested in, in the STEM fields. Well, and if I can also mention, we also do STEAM. So those of you that are you familiar with STEAM where A is the arts? So we have um, interviewed an author illustrator, Vanessa Brantley Newton, and she um, challenges everyone to draw their own illustrated character. But we also were able to interview um, Grammy award-winning conductor and composer, Eric Whitaker, who just did, if you're familiar of the virtual choir, um, he, I met him and he, can I just say he's amazing, um, but we interviewed him and his challenge, which is open to 
people of all ages is to create a, comp a one minute composition, load it up to Instagram and tag him and he will listen to it. So um, if you are at all into music, um, so we, we do all, all aspects of STEM and STEAM. And Jennifer, Jennifer, don't forget, don't forget on that STEAM thing, we also had the first lady of magic oh, in God. Australia come on and talk about how to cut a person in half safely. <laughs> safely. Safely. And you can try this at home. Absolutely. Yes. You give if you're really bored at home, right? Absolutely. <laughs> this is what you can try. Follow the, safely. follow the instructions. <laughs> Um, so do we have any questions for us? I don't know. I'm not looking at the chat. Are, are we good? Um, I think everyone's good on Zoom. Let's see. Any questions on the YouTube live? Nope. Nope, we're good. Okay, well, thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Dr. Jane. It was wonderful speaking with you. And thanks, Diane, or Diana, for having us on this wonderful uh, conference, Go Science and STEM. Yes, absolutely. Thanks so much. Talk to you guys soon. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Such great energy. Um, so now for the next 20 minutes, don't go just yet because we're going to have a lot of fun. Um, we're just going to have a networking session right now. So um, it's a lot of just chill time and getting to know each other through some fun icebreakers and activities. Um, I know, you know, you just listened to a few hours of lectures if you've been with us since the morning. So this is going to be a nice, um, a nice breather. And we will be joined by Kimberly Weifling, if you saw her in the chat. Um, Kimberly Weifling, super awesome, and she's going to help us connect and get to know each other. Um, and she also helps teams, individuals, and organizations achieve what seems impossible um, by turning managers into leaders and groups of people into real teams. So um, thank you so much for joining us today, Kimberly. Wow, what a great intro. Hey, I don't know about you, but I need a little stretch. So let's do a little stretch you can do on Zoom anytime. I'm just going to stand up and invite everybody to stand up. Hopefully you can see me. We're going to do, it's called YWLT stretch, okay? So make a big Y with your body. Why are we here? Oh, we